joining us attending the survey conference on Data Act. Uh, Data Act, as we know, uh, represents the last episode of a long thread of European intervention aimed at enhancing data sharing. Uh, so it's going to complement other European rules and initiatives devoted to foster data portability and data sharing. Uh, it has been quite a long journey, not only for policymakers, but also for the SARA academic team. Uh, we thought it would be useful to feed the debate from the very beginning, and so we contributed to the European Commission Data Act proposal by providing suggestions on how to improve the proposal. Accordingly, we delivered um, a first assessment paper in the last July and three reports between November and last February on specific issues addressed in the Data Act, namely on the B2B and B2B uh, data sharing obligation, the switching and interoperability between data processing services and the business to data government uh, sharing. Um, these parts of the data arc are not necessarily connected. And one of the issues that we face in analyzing the proposal has been the risk of coordination within the act among the different obligation and goals pursued. Uh, for this reason, this conference is structured around three main panels laid by the authors of each of the mentioned reports, illustrating and discussing uh, our several recommendation. And um, as the proposal for the Data Act is entered in the trilogue negotiation phase, we hope this conference and their several recommendations may further contribute to the debate and support European institutions in finalizing negotiation, because even if negotiations are moving fast, there is still room. We do believe there is still room for improvement. Uh, we have a great lineup, a terrific lineup of speaker, but unfortunately also a tight schedule. So I will proceed with uh, any further ado, giving the floor to the member of the European Parliament, Pilar de Castillo Vera, for a keynote speech. Thank you for accepting our invitation. She's connected live. I forget the mention. Okay, it seems that we have some problem to get the connection. So in order to not lose time, we may start with the first panel and then we'll find a way to uh, get the connection with the MEPs, right? Okay, uh, about the first panel, as I mentioned, the first panel is related to B2B and B2B, B2C data sharing obligation. Uh, I will leave uh, the floor to Ian Kramer, that is the the Surrey Academic Co-Director and Professor of Internet and Telecommunication Business at the University of Passau. Ian delivered the report on the specific pillar of the Data Act. Then we will get insight from our panelists. Uh, that will be Maya Bakash, uh, Executive Board Member of the French Regulator for Telecommunication and Postal Service that is online connecting, uh, Sabine Segerke, uh, Head of Public Affairs for Europe, Middle East, and, and Africa with Zurich, Zurich Insurance, Johan Nick, uh, Senior Director, uh, EU Government Affairs, Siemens, and Veronika Shlava Vinklarkova. Uh, I have to apologize if I mispronounce some surname, feel free to do the same with mine. Um, and digital and telecommunication agenda team uh, permanent presentation of the Czech Republic to the EU. So I leave the floor to Ian for his presentation. His 10 min minutes maximum presentation. Yes, thank you, Giuseppe. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us here at a very timely occasion to discuss the, the Data Act. And it's my pleasure now to introduce the SARA recommendations of the first paper on B2B and B2C data sharing. Um, as Giuseppe said, I only have 10 minutes, so I will be very brief and there's more detail in the written report, of course. Um, so our overall impression of the Data Act uh, is, and these particular obligations, the B2B and B2C sharing obligations is that it's overly complex and involves just too many transaction costs to really, follow up on the uh, premise that the 
data shall be freed from the yes, sign yes, and there shall be no free sorry. flow of data coming from IoT devices. Yes. Um, it is a very good starting part, however, the general idea that there is a hand data portability rights. So consumers having um, consumers, users of IoT devices, having the possibility to take their data out um, that in a continuous manner and not only personal, but also non-personal data. However, that general right for data portability in a sense, enhanced right, is being uh, made very complex and complicated through numerous extension, numerous exceptions to that rule. Um, these are, for example, the need to negotiate a price, um, the necessity that data cannot be given to gatekeepers under the DMA, certain firms are being exempt, um, data access is very limited in the first place, and so therefore a more effective data act really needs to be simpler, recognizing that it's a horizontal regulation applying to tens of thousands of devices. And uh, in order to really tr truly live up to the premise uh, to uh, free data from its silos. And this leads me to the four key recommendations that I will be highlighting today in this presentation. Um, and the first is that there is a no competition clause in the Data Act, meaning that whenever you receive data, you can not develop a competing product to the product from which the data was received. Now, why is the case, uh, why is that clause in, in the Data Act? It's, of course, uh, a balancing act to um, preserve, on the one hand, innovation incentives of those data holders, those manufacturers of devices. On the other hand, it's um, a tool, uh, supposedly a tool, to give innovation incentives to those that receive data. So that trade-off can be made in numerous ways, and the Data Act does it, for example, in only providing access to raw data, data that is readily available to the data holder that already resides on some remote server. Doing or giving rise to a no competition clause on top of that is problematic for a number of reasons, uh, because it makes the, the, the law much more complicated in the first place, then it means um, that raw data, when you get access to raw data as a data access seeker, you cannot readily develop a product from that anyway, you will need significant investments and innovation efforts to develop a competing product from this. Um, it also stifles entry in the very markets that uh, the Data Act seems, seeks to uh, empower, which is the related markets, the aftermarkets, uh, where if you cannot use that market as a stepping stone to eventually build a competing product or you know, whatever a competing product is, it also means there's legal uncertainty involved in defining product markets in how much innovation you've efforts you've already undertaken when you re once you receive data. Um, but it also prevents the secondary markets to be a stepping stone to going in the, in the primary markets. And therefore, there's less incentive to go in the secondary markets in the first place. Um, so there's a number of issues associated with that. And ultimately, it's also competition that is a driver of innovation. So having a no competition clause seems um, a little bit too much in an, in an era where we're trying to enforce more competition in the digital markets. The second recommendation is on the price for access for getting the data. So remember that uh, the data is supposed to be accessed is raw data that's being co-generated by users of these devices um, together with sort of the manufacturers providing the device. So if the idea of the philosophy of the Data Act is that data is co-generated and data access is limited to data that is readily available, already resides on some server, so don't that, that, that don't do have to be much uh, efforts going into providing access to that data. So the presumption should be that the marginal cost for providing access to the data is zero, which then means that also the price should regularly be zero for accessing the data. Uh, this is a rebuttable presumption, so if it basically reverses the burden of proof, if you really can prove that there are significant efforts in having to provide access to the data, there might be a case for uh, a positive price, but having a zero access price is beneficial for a number of reasons, because um, it gives this whole negotiation on the price, which, again, tens of thousands of devices access seekers would have to negotiate on a price. Of course, there will not be a, a, a quick conclusion to that negotiation process. So ultimately these cases will end up in court and um, that makes it overly complex and not very effective. 
having a standing presumption at zero would be a much more effective approach here. The third recommendation is um, that the, um, the recipients of the data should not be restricted. And that includes gatekeepers under the DMA. Why is that the case? Well, first of all, there is a specific regulation for gatekeepers, which is the DMA, and there are already provisions in place for data siloing and uh, limiting data fusion. So if there's issues with gatekeepers, then we should handle that in the DMA as a specific regulation for gatekeepers and not in the Data Act, which is a horizontal regulation. It's not the right place to put restrictions for the gatekeepers. Second, gatekeepers have proven in the past to be great sources of great innovators, particularly when it comes to data driven and services. So that also means preventing gatekeepers from access that uh, innovation uh, will be stifled or potential for innovation will be stifled, maybe in an overly um, um, in an overly way. And um, finally, uh, it does not all the DA does not prevent gatekeepers from getting access generally because they can also negotiate directly with the data holders to get access. So the DA does not prevent, after all, gatekeepers from getting access at all. It just prevents that users uh, can give the data on to gatekeepers. And finally, a uh, recommendation is that the Data Act, as it applies horizontally, uh, and also in, in view of some of the recommendations I made before, uh, zero access price, for example, that also medium-sized enterprises should be exempt from the application or from, the, from providing data under the Data Act. I mean, we should keep in mind that medium-sized enterprises are really not that large. So they less, have less than 250 employees and uh, an annual turnover of less than 50 million euros. So we know also from other horizontal applications, horizontal regulations, such as the GDPR, that especially small companies have been unduly hit by this. And therefore, our recommendation is to exempt also medium-sized enterprises from the Data Act. Taken together, these are the four recommendations I wanted to highlight for today, removing the non-competition clause, having a zero access price by default for the raw data being readily available to the data holder, co-generated with the user, and um, that there should be no further restrictions on data recipients, which then also make it difficult to comply with the Data Act for data brokers, third parties getting access to the data, always have to make sure the data is not being passed on to gatekeepers. And uh, finally, also to exempt small, uh, medium, um, and micro enterprises from the application of the Data Act. And with that, thank you very much for my introduction. I hope I kept it within the 10 minutes. Uh, Thank you, Jan, also for respecting the, the time limits. And apparently, before moving to our panelists, apparently it seems that we have solved our technical issues when we established the connection with the MEP Pilar de Castillo. Um, again, thank you for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours for the keynote speech. Yes, thank you very much. And I want really to uh, say sorry because there was some technical problems and uh, I couldn't enter on time, and I have to leave uh, very soon. I want to, well, start in saying that I appreciate very much uh, uh, the, the invitation from uh, Sere uh, to give uh, this, uh, in principle, keynote speech uh, for today's event entrusted uh, to the Data Act. Uh, let me say that uh, the event is clearly well structured, and each of the three panels responds, in me and, on my understanding, to an interesting report that Sere is presented. Uh, regrettably, uh, you know that I will uh, have to leave soon. Uh, only in a few minutes, uh, I will par be participating in a debate with Commissioner Breton at the ITRE committee, and I have to be there. But uh, consequently to that, let me immediately set the scene. All three institutions are very much aware that uh, data is the primary resource of digital technologies. The development of the cloud, big data, AI, or quantum depend uh, on the availability of data. This is uh, something that is not questionable. And with the development of IoT, the increase of data will be exponential. By 2030, the global value of IoT services could reach up to 11 trillion euros. 
And we know from the commission that 80% of industrial IoT data is underused. Clearly, when this, uh, you will see this panorama, clearly Europe is not reaping the full value of data. In this context, uh, the Data Act has the potential to be an absolute game changer if it can create a data agile ecosystem that enables uh, easy access to an almost infinite amount of uh, high quality industrial uh, data. Uh, in other words, um, well, this is uh, of paramount importance uh, for the use uh, competitiveness at a time where data will mainly come from connected things. And that means uh, that especially uh, is important uh, for the industrial data uh, and is a growing for that reason competitive asset uh, for Europe. Uh, an asset that we have, uh, we must even, I would say, I want to emphasize this, uh, we must optimize. Uh, let's not lose in that sense in sight uh, of what our international competitors are doing. Uh, the US, for example, not only exhibits far more dynamic industrial investment, but it's developing policies such as the Inflation Reduction Act that will further increase disadvantage. Uh, again, uh, we take into account this, in this context, the Data Act will be instrumental for our competitiveness in the global markets. The new rules will empower consumers and companies by giving them a say of what can be done uh, with the data generated uh, by their uh, connected products. And here is precisely where the biggest potential of the data act lies uh, for, the, for the EU. Uh, this regulation will contribute to optimizing existing business models and processes, boost the development of new ones, and by doing so, creating new value and jobs. Uh, regarding especially um, Parliament uh, report, I must say that we have greatly improved the Commission's proposal, uh, departing uh, from the same principle, for the principle that the user should have access to the data produced by its connected uh, devices or related services and be able to share it. Parliament has, amongst other issues, uh, this is some examples for starters, answer the question of what IoT data falls under the scope of the obligation of the Data Act. One of the first problems we uh, found at the very beginning from all stakeholders was the unclear definition of data in the original proposal. So what kind of data we are talking about? Uh, so our first act was a debate and debate with uh, so many stakeholders, by the way, uh, a debate in, inside the parliament on the definition of data. In that sense, we established two categories. What is in the scope, what was out of the scope. In the scope are data in raw form and well as, uh, as well as, sorry, prepared data. So data that could be purely raw, but then you have the problem that are uh, unreadable. Uh, or uh, prepare data that give uh, to the use of those data a chance to understand uh, the, the, uh, and read the data, basically. Um, this kind of data uh, is data that uh, clean and transform, uh, a kind of data that are clean and transform prior to processing and analysis uh, later on. Uh, the other um, uh, data, uh, uh, it was the data we are uh, out of the scope uh, are derived from inferred data. This means data resulting from highly sophisticated processes that calculate derivative insights, and then you can know uh, the business core, uh, the business uh, design of the, of, the, of the product. So if you do not permit this kind of data uh, in terms of uh, have the right to have access, then you are protecting trade secrets and IP rights. 
was not possible to change the uh, definition of uh, trade secrets. This is an international standard. So the final conclusion was better to work with the definition of data. So uh, raw data or pre-prepared data in the sense I uh, explained, uh, which are not at the core of the design and those highly sophisticated data than you know it, you can really uh, produce a competing uh, product. Second, um, I want to mention that we have uh, introduced a clear attribution of rights and obligations of data holders, users, and data recipients with an improved structure of chapter two and three. Third, we have taken on board many of the safety and security concerns that we found in our debates with uh, um, enormous uh, amounts, a real array of stakeholders. Uh, and now security risks uh, could be a reason not to share data until the competent authority decides on the uh, threat. Uh, likewise, as the commission, we have excluded small and macro enterprises from the scope of the obligation of the regulation. But, but in addition, we have provided medium-sized enterprises with a favorable compensation regime. Uh, six on chapter, which establishes the obligation of shared data with public authorities under exceptional circumstances, Parliament has adopted a very balanced approach, in my opinion. The obligation to share data will only be possible when responding to a public emergency, which has been declared by national law, or when it is not accessible in the market and the public body is competent to do so by law. In addition, provisions that strengthen the transparency and liability of public bodies when requesting data under exceptional needs had been also introduced. Seven, lastly, and lastly, uh, the coordination has been strengthened by streaming under a single authority um, that the request of uh, public sector bodies uh, for data the data coordinator is called in the, in the text. Um, surely the final agreement uh, amongst the co-legislators will provide further improvements uh, to the original proposal uh, and our proposal in Parliament. But I must say that Parliament has provided a solid and balanced position. I believe that with 500 votes in favor and only 23 against, we are in a very good departing position for the negotiations that uh, will start tomorrow, precisely. I am confident that in three months, uh, in the three months to come, with three political dialogues and 19 technical dialogues, uh, together with the political will, which is absolutely decisive in, in, in this, uh, a negotiation and many others as well. We have a good shot at achieving an agreement under the Swedish presidency. Uh, I believe all institutions are committed and agree that the Data Act is an effort worth making. It's about our capacity uh, to compete and innova innovate. Uh, it's about also about uh, sovereignty in strategic terms in some way, or part of it. Uh, and the Data Act is precisely about that. This is about innovation and competitiveness. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. It's a pity I cannot uh, stay uh, longer, uh, but probably we'll have another uh, future option or possibilities. But now I have to move quickly to the room where I have the meeting uh, with my colleagues and Commissioner Breton. Thank you very much. Thank you for your speech and thank you for uh, 
having from the time and the slot in your busy schedule. Um, so uh, we can move to our panelists about the, the first panel on B2B and B2C. Um, I would ask them to um, keep a first round of remarks in three minutes per, per speaker. Um, they are free to address both the relevance of the B2B, B2C obligation in the, in the Data Act, as well as uh, how a recommendation, if they found some recommendation useful to uh, promote the finalization of the Data Act, if they disagree on uh, some of our recommendation. Uh, I will I will start with Maya Bakash. The, he, she's joined us online. Uh, Maya, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, Hello. Thank you. So th thank you very much for this wonderful report. Thank you, Jan. It was very clear and uh, uh, worth discuss discussing. So maybe I'll discuss the first recommendation you presented today uh, about uh, the non-competitive competitive clause. Uh, in my view, uh, well, the, we, we need to take a step back maybe and ask ourselves why we need to regulate. <laughs> In, in this, uh, that sense, and in my opinion, we we are facing two different market failures, at, as economists put it. Uh, the first one is about economies of scale, uh, meaning that because of uh, big data and and data data, uh, we have increased increased efficiency, uh, hence an advantage uh, for big firms or big platforms. Uh, but in my opinion, this market failure is already dealt with uh, in the DMA and in anti-competitive anti regulation. Uh, however, here we have another market failure that's very important, which is, uh, well, let's say, um, external effects on future innovation, meaning that uh, data are not only uh, creating data enhanced businesses, as in the first market failure, but we also have uh, data enabled businesses, so hence new businesses, new innovation. Um, here we need uh, to have a regulation uh, that uh, helps future innovation, that open ecosystems of innovation, uh, which are now uh, rather closed. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, we, we we have this non-competitive clause because the, that, the Data Act distinguishes between primary market and secondary markets, uh, meaning the primary market uh, would be uh, concerned with um, uh, economies of scale, and the secondary market would be concerned with innovation and opening those ecosystems for future innovation. Uh, so that's that's how I, I understand uh, this uh, this point in the Data Act. Uh, where I I I, um, I agree with your remarks and uh, your uh, your. Um, your doubts is that in the platform economy, it's very difficult to distinguish between primary and secondary markets. Uh, it would be very tricky for the regulator to distinguish between what is a direct competitor and what is an indirect competitor in that sense because of a uh, multi-sided economy, basically. Uh, so that's my first major remark. And I, if I still have one minute, or may, maybe I can stop and let the, and leave the floor for other uh, discussion, as, as you as you like. Just tell me if I can if go. If you on. want, you have still thirty seconds. <laughs> okay, can so very 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 shortly on the on the cost on the, the zero price uh, zero zero access price uh, re recommendation. Uh, so yes, I agree. If 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 marginal cost is, is equal to zero, indeed, uh, we cannot have a, a, a price to access those data because it will be a barrier to entry in a way. But if we have a pro-competitive and pro-innovation regulator that's able to uh, evaluate the cost, to assess the cost, uh, we, 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 could, we, could have, uh, we could still have a, a, an access price. And in that sense, they, they may, there, there is such thing as an excessive entry. Uh, so uh, the, the the price or the cost here would have the, the the value, the advantage of limiting excessive entry and giving some rationale for new efficient uh, business models. Thank, Thank you, you, Maya. Um, Sabine, I would ask you to jump in for your remark. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I think uh, the word we now heard a couple of times is 
timely. This is a very timely uh, exchange uh, with the trilogue uh, happening uh, tomorrow and enormous progress uh, in the institutions on the Data Act. So unsurprisingly, I'm going to repeat that as well. It is very timely, but also very timely for us as an insurance company. Um, I work for Zurich uh, Insurance. Um, this is a very old company. Uh, we've been around actually for 150 years. We celebrated that uh, just last year. Um, but we cannot afford to be complacent. You know, we are the kind of company we need to reinvent ourselves constantly. And what drives this um, innovation in the company, looking also at business models, is digitalization. Data as such is not new for insurance. Data, that's, uh, you know, bread and butter are in an insurance company. But having access to data, which currently sits in a very fragmented way uh, across our ecosystems and various industries and connecting that data, that can really fuel a change process we're experiencing right now in Zurich Insurance from just identifying risks, covering risks, to moving to prevention. So really working with customers before uh, risks really occur. So I'm saying timely here because a lot is at stake. And now I'm going to speed up looking at uh, the chairman, <laughs> Ed Wise. Um, the Data Act, I think um, we're very optimistic about it. We clearly believe um, it is a game changer. Um, and the progress in the institutional deliberations has been um, very impressive. What resonated with me um, listening to the intervention uh, of Jan Kramer is his call to action. Um, uh, make it simple so you can truly free uh, data from silos. So we fully support that because we think the Data Act needs to be a principle-based uh, legislation. Um, it shouldn't go into too much detail. Um, we support the tightening uh, process the last couple of months. And we think a lot of um, initiatives will happen in other sector-specific uh, initiatives. For insurance, for example, we have high hopes for the uh, open finance uh, framework currently prepared by the European Commission. And I can go to that maybe in the next round. Thank you. Uh Johannes, uh, it's your turn. Thank you. Also, the industrial sector, and um, in particular, what I'd like to focus on is the business to business sector because I think um, we see many use cases in the, in the uh, data act in the, in the business and consumer field um, where it makes a lot of sense, but then in the um, business to business. We see that it's often quite quite a different scenario. That very often in the past there is already a lot of data sharing. Um, there is uh, most relationships are based on uh, contractual relationships um, as well as cooperation. And um, so there are some points. Um, I can say so the industrial data economy is just about to start. There's really a huge potential for IoT data usage um, for the digital and green transformation in Europe. Um, and in order to grow and scale industrial data economy and to achieve this, um, companies really need the freedom and also the, the legal certainty to invest here um, to build partnerships and to try out innovative solutions. And we want Europe to take advantage of that. I would hear, if I understood uh, Ms. Del Castillo correctly, she said um, that we are behind the US, but I would say in, when it comes to B2B and industrial applications, uh, Europe is actually a leader, and there I think uh, there's this great potential. Um, and therefore, we share also this, this overall goal of uh, leveraging the, the data economy. Uh, Janis, excuse me, can you uh, speak closer to the microphone? Because apparently online they are unable to hear you. Sure. Sorry about that. Um, so we share the goal of leveraging the European data economy, but we are worried about the approach that the data takes. Uh, because it doesn't really reflect how data is um, currently shared in industrial applications and how industrial value chains work. Um, so it has to be rebalanced in that way. Um, so there's, there's three points I'd, I'd like to focus on. The first one is uh, the definition of the, of the data holder. Um, very often in the industrial field, the manufacturer 
does not actually control or hold the data, but if the data only lies to the customer, that's usually uh, managed by, by contractual relationships. Um, the second point is, um, and Mr. D mentioned this, the protection of trade secret is extremely important, and we really feel there's still some need to for improvement in the current text. And the third point uh, is on the access by design uh, requirements that can be very burdensome in because not uh, not every device is designed and is needed in a way that it would automatically share data. But here, so so where I would also uh, make reference to the report, the zero cost for the manufacturer is not always zero cost because uh, we do we probably in product design we would have some significant. Uh, adjustments to be made. I, I do strongly agree with the point that is uh, overly complex regulation, and um, we see a risk that in combination with other regulation, it might rather create much many burdens upon industry, and might potentially in the worst case even hinder innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jans. Uh, finally, we have Veronica. Uh, please, uh, next. Also for you, try to speak close to the microphone because apparently online are struggling to hear us. Uh, reiterating and underlying the main goal of the Data Act, which is uh, to enhance data economy and uh, unlocking the potential of data, because we all agree um, with uh, the statement that data equals opportunity, and uh, we can we can benefit from that together collectively as the European Union. Uh, but uh, the data are not used to its maximum. We are seeing examples where data holders, if we if we use terminology from the Data Act, are trying to use the potential of the data by uh, developing new business models, by uh, opening their data and sharing them with other uh, market actors. But it's only one portion of the market actors, and uh, it, it can be done in a much more efficient way. And this is exactly what the Data Act is trying to, to address. So so it identifies the main uh, opportunities and trends in the market that are happening anyway on, the, on its own, but it accelerates the change. And uh, it's also important to mention that this change is viewed as a, as a positive one. Uh, since the, the adoption or uh, introduce, introduction of the proposal by the Commission, we are hearing nothing uh, but positive words about the intention of the proposal. And this is important to keep in mind because uh, there are some regulations that might not be as positive, but Data Act is definitely a positive one. And if I should uh, and my opening remark with something uh, specific to, to the report. Uh, Jan uh, is, is pointing out uh, four recommendations, but I would like to draw your attention to two recommendations in the report uh, that were not raised here during the presentation, but that were already addressed in uh, the mandate of the Council and in the Parliament. And I think it's worth mentioning because um, it was just not made uh, out of thin air, this decision. And I'm talking about recommendation to uh, limit the scope to only raw data and to uh, enlarge the scope to more products. And uh, actually in the, in the council mandate, we are enlarging the scope to all the products connected, uh, but we are more focusing on narrowing down the scope of data. And I think that these recommendations were quite crucial for us uh, to navigate ourselves in the scope of the B2B and B2C relations. And uh, it's worth mentioning specifically because um, it's, it was done because of you, because of stakeholders and inputs from research organizations and papers like this one that help us realize in the council uh, what is the path we want to take in the proposal. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Veronica. We have time for... Um... Q&A session. Uh, I'm hoping that for both question about both the question. Uh, I don't know whether there are someone in the room and in the virtual room that has question for our presenter and our panelist. Uh, otherwise, I would. Uh, there is. Oh yeah, sorry. Hi, my name is Bert Haig from BBVA, Spanish Bank. I have a question concerning the fit between this uh, horizontal regulation and the vertical regulations Zabina has mentioned. 
uh, for financial services, but also I understand they exist uh, also in other industries. Um, question to the panel, actually. How do you feel uh, that fit is uh, realized? Is it enough? What is said in the Data Act to connect these different vertical data regulations, data spaces? Um, does it do enough? Must there be a uh, Data Act 2.0 in order to complement it? Or um, is there uh, done enough? And are there enough uh, data spaces uh, sector-wise already defined, existing in development? Because, well, there's the health data space, for example, uh, we have it in financial services, but what about other industries? How do you see that uh, data from other sectors can be made available cross-sector wise uh, in order to exploit really the data economy? Well, thank you. Uh, the question, I guess, is broad enough to involve everyone that is joining the panel. So who wants to start? Happy, happy to start. Okay. Um, it's an excellent question um, because as we heard before, um, pretty much everyone um, endorses the objectives of the Data Act, I think. Everyone is applauding. Will it deliver, you know, and it will only deliver if this connection is there in a sound way, both with uh, horizontal legislation, thinking here about uh, GDPR uh, in particular, but also vertic um, vertical sector specific legislation. Now, uh, in financial services, I think um, the key milestone is going to be uh, the open finance framework prepared by the European Commission. For the non-financial service people here in the room, why do I care so much about it? Um, if you look at insurance, um, we don't have standardization uh, in our industry. Banks, you know, they have a common language. They can exchange information historically for quite a while. There's regulation uh, in place. I'm oversimplifying a bit, but they are in a good place. We lack that. We lack that standardization. So if we want to offer our consumers, European citizens, better services, and that includes also comparing offer they may get from us, offer they get from other insurance companies, uh, understanding what is the information they get from us, the information they get, let's say, from a repair shop when they experience a car accident and the car needs to be repaired. All that flow of information is, is currently hampered by the fact that we do not have standardization uh, in insurance. So that needs to be ha happen. We need a very ambitious uh, open finance framework, which is um, built in a mandatory way, but bottom up uh, with uh, industry uh, involved. And it will deliver, I think, uh, really added value for consumers as well. So that's my now very self-centered financial services slash uh, insurance uh, perspective. You ask about other sectors uh, as well. And I think a sector where a lot of potential is currently untapped, frankly, is uh, automotive. Uh, now, I don't have a car myself. I'm more of a bike person. But if we look at cars and innovation in the car industry, it's really fascinating. Cars, they really start to resemble um, smartphones on wheels. There's enormous data. And if you look at the various innovative companies in that space uh, in the supply chain um, as well, they currently don't have uh, the right access to the data they need to provide these services. So we will uh, need uh, an access to in-vehicle um, legislation as well for that particular industry. We cannot solve everything in the Data Act. Again, I think I applaud the efforts the last couple of months of tightening uh, the Data Act and making it very principle-based. It will deliver if we have in parallel these um, sector-specific initiatives. Ian, quick reaction from your side. Yes, also uh, from my side, I want to, want to echo a lot of what you've said, but just put it in very simple terms that the Data Act is a horizontal regulation applying to tens of thousands of devices, as I said it before. And it would be madness 
to think of you know specific rules that would apply in specific contexts in a horizontal regulation. You need necessarily sector specific regulation to complement that. So in the data act, we want to have simple rules as simple as possible, not doing harm, but yet being also the goals of the data act have to be a little bit more humble, I think, in one in some directions. So repair services are mentioned explicitly in the goals of the data act. It doesn't really do anything for repair services, if we're honest. You don't have a you know, a right to write data. Right? You just have a right to get raw data out. And uh, for these circumstances, we need sector-specific relation in the vehicle context and the financial context in other contexts. Uh, but we need, therefore, to have the rules in the Data Act to be as simple as possible uh, without hurting innovation, uh, but also having the capability to actually uh, free data, which is the core idea, and not to make it so complex that eventually no one will want to access data. And I'm also a little bit surprised in that context, actually, that RCEP, as a telecom regulator, thinks that it's uh, the regulator should be able to determine cost for tens of thousands of devices uh, and what the regular cost, what the what the cost basis is, having the experience from telecom companies where it's appealing, it's just one product, just one service fairly easy comparatively service. And yet it took us about 20 years to find the right cost standard and to write the right uh, regime for that. Uh, so I don't want to see that for the Data Act and tens of thousands of, of IoT devices. Thank you, Ian. I personally love the call for regulatory humility in, in general terms, but that's just my opinion. Maya, please jump in. Yes, I, I need to answer. Um... I think uh, no, nothing is more harmful than uh, closing data than having a, a big, uh, a big slow and uh, heavy regulator. Okay, so I concur with the fact that we need an agile regulator, pro innovation, pro uh, uh, pro digital technologies, uh, and 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 a regulator that can adapt. Uh, so in my uh, in my view, this data act uh, is needs also to be very simple, and we need to have later on some guidelines, a pragmatic approach to regulation, a regulator able to discuss with companies, with users, and 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 to adapt and to be agile. So that's I think it's a, it's a very 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 important uh, thing because uh, uh, here we are talking about innovation for the future, and we really don't need a big uh, big heavy regulator in the room. Thank you. Uh, you want? Please. Uh, naturally, as an industrial player, I'm uh, cooperating in many different verticals, but nonetheless, we have uh, from the beginning. Uh, Jan, sorry, uh, it's not your fault, it's fault of the microphone. So please uh, take advantage of Veronica once because apparently they're unable. Okay. okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so indeed, we from the beginning argued for uh, rather to take um, a sectoral approach and not go for horizontal approach. And it's exactly because of what we're experiencing here. It's not a, a one size fits all approach. And um, we've seen um, in vehicle data were mentioned at the beginning. Um, and it was, of course, for, for industrial stakeholders confusing that the, some of the main use cases presented by the Commission were exactly on in-vehicle data, but then together with the Data Act, there was the announcement, oh, there will be something on top. So it's, um, it's, 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 will, it's a big challenge, in my opinion. So, so here, rather, we go for the sectoral approach would have been favorable over a horizontal approach. Thank you. Please, Veronica. Thank you. Um... So uh, as was already said by, by Jan, uh, Data Act is horizontal uh, legislation and uh, as is Johannes would prefer maybe the, the, the sectoral ones, uh, I think that the horizontal one is, is uh, quite good because data, uh, data economy uh, was not regulated before in any way and we don't have any rules, any principles that are established. So having at least some basic um, elements that we can all adhere to and have some common sense how to approach is, is good. Uh, so it's good to have some 
common basic uh, principles and rules that will navigate the rest of us uh, how, how to operate and then it can be then complemented by by the sector legislation and uh, as Sabine mentioned, automotive is uh, one specific sector that uh, is talked about quite some time. So we might uh, see soon some uh, specific uh, case how this sector legislation will complement horizontal. Uh, but this will be, of course, uh, a task for some future future years. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have also um, a question that has been raised online. Uh, the question is, uh, the Council is proposing to extend the scope to data recipient outside the Union, irrespective of their place of establishment, contrary to the Commission and Parliament. Uh, could you explain the reasoning? Anyone want to so I, I, provide an answer? Okay. I can expect that this is <laughs> this is question targeted to me. Uh, so this addition, irrespective of place of establishment, is to make sure that uh, we cover um, uh, actors that are operating in the European Union. So uh, if they operate in the European Union, they are in the scope uh, and they can be, you know, third uh, third country established outside. But if they operate in the EU market, they should be covered by the Data Act. So this was uh, the basic logic behind this change. Thank you. Uh, further question for our panelists? Uh, hi there, it's Matt from Vodafone Group. Uh, thank you for the, the presentations and the interesting discussion. Um, a question for, for Jan and then I think the rest of the panel. Um, I think we've made no secret of the fact that we don't agree with every single recommendation and conclusion in your report, but what we really do appreciate and value about it as a piece of work is that it does cut through some of the I think we can say confusion and complexity that exists in the Commission's proposal. Um, in that it's attempting to achieve two objectives at the same time, and those objectives are potentially pulling in opposite directions. So creating economic incentives or preserving, we should say, economic incentives for, for data holders, whilst also opening up access for, for third parties and access seekers. And, you know, we don't believe that the two are completely irre irreconcilable, but there are some inherent tensions there. And it, and it tends to a lot of complexity, as I say, in the commission proposals and, and caveats and some kind of circular logic. Um, and Jan, I think what your report does really well is it cuts through a lot of this um, and it would seem, in our view, to tip the the favour on the scales much more towards the access seeker, um, which it, which would result in uh, probably a, a a more impactful uh, and actually logical and coherent regulation at the end of the day. Um, I just wanted to invite maybe some reflections from the rest of the panel on that that delicate balance within the regulation. If you have the same perspective that we do, that they, it does create some complexity, and um, if you would share our reflections, that maybe some of the the conclusions in Jan report, Jan's report go for, too far in the other direction in terms of uh, tipping the balance in favour of the access seeker uh, in, in place of the data holder. And maybe if you have any views on how we can reconcile those tensions, and if you're optimistic that we we end up with a, a regulation which is actually coherent and and, and workable. Maybe if you allow me just to have the first uh, first reaction to that is I, I agree very much with your um, impression. Um, I, be, I truly believe that this balancing act, which is the core of what the data act needs to do, can be done by limiting access to certain types of data, which is raw data readily available. So what does that mean? And that's uh, something that's been taken up. It was very precise in the council, in the, in the initial um, proposal, but then the council made it more clear. What I mean by that is not data that's being generated on the device as such, but data that's been sent off to some remote server at its lowest level. And that's at the choosing of the manufacturer or the data holder. So if you have, let's say you're recording voice data um, and you choose to send off the raw WAV file, that is the raw data that's readily available, not what resides on the device. Uh, if you choose to transcribe that on the device and send sort of the text off to the remote server, then it's the, the text, but not both. You don't get access to the WAV file and the text, for example. Uh, just one, the lowest level available to the data holder at that remote server. That, for me, is the balancing act. If you give access to such raw data, which has not been 
processed in a, in a, in a significant way, um, then I have a difficult time seeing how you can develop a competing product from that readily without true innovation efforts. I have a difficult time seeing how that could compete on trade secrets. Um, and I have also a difficult time why, if that data is truly co-generated, and that is the philosophical idea behind it, if that why that data needs to be priced at a margin. Uh, which is still in the proposals uh, being put forward right now. And this is why I think there's lots of potential to make it easier in the ways I've presented. Thank you, Ian. I would ask the, our panelists for a final one minute quick reaction. I will follow the initial order. So, Maya, your final reaction. Yes, thank you. Maybe uh, an additional point that I wanted to make is that, um, in my opinion, this act uh, actually creates a market. So it answers to the first market failure, which is uh, law and order, right? I mean, we were lacking uh, a market, a data market. We had uncertainty about rights and obligation, about cost of contracting. Uh, we had a high level of fragmentations and, and so on. So here it's the first step to create the market. And in that sense, uh, it gives uh, mainly incentives uh, to, uh, to, 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 to build data, to create business, uh, new business models and so on. So in, in my view, it's a first major step. And the first steps to be made uh, will be uh, will be expected if, from from the European regulator and the national regulators. Are they able to be innovative, pragmatic, and agile enough to to uh, to make the trade off the right balance between incentives and uh, and openness? Thank you, Maya. Sabine, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I also try to connect to the question from our colleague from uh, Vodafone. Um, I think the data act can be uh, a massive uh, game changer. Um, we fully support uh, the enhanced uh, data portability rights. I'm not too concerned about what you just uh, raised. The data act will only deliver if it's well embedded the broader landscape, what I just uh, outlined, the sector specific uh, regulation, which also needs to happen, like open finance or like access to in vehicle data. Thank you, Sabine. Yuan. Thank you. Also, um, referring to the question, I think indeed it's important here to, to bring, there's a lot of complexity in the Commission proposal, and therefore a report such as this helps to bring, bring more clarity. I also would definitely say that the work of the Council and the Parliament has helped a lot to bring more clarity here. Um, and lastly, I would say the Data Act, it's it's too important. We cannot get it wrong. We must get it right. And therefore, it's also important. I think the topic today is how to finish it. I think it's very important also not to rush it now. We have the two mandates. But nonetheless, it's very important that the negotiators take their time and also um, assess the needs of European industry and make sure that it remains a very innovative um, continent. Thank you. So um, I think that today we were discussing several ways how to improve data act and uh, to the question of complexity. Uh, already the, the proposal of the Commission was quite complex and now we have two versions of it uh, that adds another level of complexity to it. Uh, so it's going to be quite crucial in the upcoming months uh, once the trilogues officially start tomorrow to make sure that uh, we all and by all I mean collectively uh, as a multi-stakeholder uh, initiative to, to look at the both positions and try to identify uh, which, uh, which uh, parts of the both mandates are important and useful and how to combine them in a way that it can be efficient and, uh, as, as was said, uh, effective and uh, workable in practice, because otherwise we will end up uh, with the proposal and regulation that is not uh, useful in practice and we don't want to have that. So this is... Mm -hmm. My final words. Thank you, everyone, for this lively debate and discussion. Now we have our first and last coffee break, so we have a 20 minutes break. Stay tuned.
Sue, 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 so, 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 so. Yes, we hear you.
Okay, uh, we are back and ready to discuss our second topic related to B2G data sharing. Uh, the structure is the same for the of the first one. I will ask our presenter, um, Heiko Richter, Senior Research Fellow at Max Planck Institute that will deliver the presentation in a 10 minutes, um, a slot time slot, and then we will have um, a panel made by four panelists, uh, Matthew Allison, Senior Public Policy Manager at Vodafone, Francois Chivier, Head of Go Open Governance Program at IGN France, Mario Guglielmetti, legal officer at the EU Data Protection Supervisor, and Hanna Aurora Venakowski, senior specialist, data safety and security department, data business unit, Ministry of Transport and Communication on Finance. Uh, I would ask Aiko to take the podium um, and deliver his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We want to change your slide out. Perfect. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to present my report. And we're changing sides now. It's not businesses versus businesses, so to say. It's the state versus businesses. This makes things uh, seemingly easier, but um, it's um, probably a very political issue. So I had a close look at Chapter 5. Um, and my report elaborates basically on um, some components and gives, I think, in total 20 recommendations. Now, the basic idea of Chapter 5 is um, to open up private sector data for the common good by allowing the state to um, request data from, um, from businesses and serve the societal need, basically. And um, obviously, there are caveats because many interests are affected. Like on the one hand, the businesses, their incentives to um, to collect data, to market data, that's obvious, but also data subjects in case personal data is involved. And also, um, it requires trust in the state. And nowadays, this is not necessarily for, for granted, so it becomes a very, very touchy issue. Now, the challenge is how to reconcile these interests, and I think this is the goal of regulation, to reconcile this in a balanced way. And for this purpose, um, what I was doing is to identify four regulatory components, so to say, and consider their interconnectedness and understand them as basically levers to balance these interests. So um, when making recommendations, I try to follow a holistic approach to understand what is the consequence of this component for the other component and vice versa. And um, the goal would be um, to provide a, a legal framework that can uh, still effectively reach the regulatory goals. And as I have a legal background, as a dream of every legal scholar to have a coherent framework, which is basically impossible in this case, I think. Now, um, as you are probably familiar with the commission's draft, um, I delve into the first component right now. Um, basically, Article 15 outlines four different grounds on which um, public sector bodies all across the EU are empowered um, to request data. Um, the, first, uh, the first case is 15A, uh, to respond to public emergencies. 15B is um, to prevent or recover from public emergencies, like natural disasters, um, uh, like, um, uh, like pandemics. And then there's the case 15C1, that's the third case, which is basically to request data for fulfilling specific public interest tasks. Uh, so it's very general, it gets broader. And the last case, the fourth case is Article 15C2, um, which also empowers for, um, for requesting data to reduce administrative burdens, basically. Now, in my analysis, if you have a closer look at it, I think the scope is quite um, ill-defined in many ways, especially Article 15C is very debated because it's vague um, and it might go a bit too far. 
Um, there's also the problems of preemption and subsidiarity. That means which other rules applies once this regime is in place. And um, also, what does it mean for the um, for the separation of powers between the EU and the member states, national legislation? And another unclear relationship is the relationship between voluntary sharing agreements on the one hand and this mandatory regime on the other hand. Now, I made some recommendations, and so start from the end, which is very clear cut. I um, suggest to delete Article 15 C2 because this is a very, very, very different animal that does not fit into the concept of um, exceptional data need. And should this be implemented, I think it leads it to a lot of follow on problems that um, that um, that would make make the whole regime more complicated. Um, another, and this is probably the main plea that I have um, recommendation is to clearly limit Article 15 C1 to ad hoc cases. What does that mean as opposed to regulatory uh, regular data access, systematic, continuous, or repeated data access. And I think this delineation could be made uh, much clearer, for example, also by strengthening it with a definition in Article 2, um, what ad hoc access actually means. Um, the whole regime is based on the idea of exceptional data access, and this exceptional should not turn into a rule, basically. So that's the problem behind that. And once you have limited this scope and make it more focused, I think there are good reasons then to argue to a full derogation of national rules regarding ad hoc access. Um, I think that makes fair sense. And another aspect is, I didn't mention it yet, we heard it in the first panel, the role of um, micro and small enterprises, they're excluded in this case, but we have a very different context here. And I think it doesn't make sense to exclude them upfront because the question whether data is suitable for solving pandemics or, or other emergencies uh, is not a question of size, right? There are other means to compensate for that. So I think they should not be excluded upfront. Compensation might take legitimate interests into account and at a, at a second step. And the last is to clarify the relationship between mandatory and voluntary data sharing. What does it mean? Basically, this whole chapter five is based on practice that comes from voluntary agreements, which are already in place or have been in place um, for, for a longer time. And my concern on the one hand is that the mandatory regime would kill off the incentives to close or even make it impossible to close voluntary agreements on the one hand. So that should be made sure that this doesn't happen. On the other hand, it must be prevented that uh, voluntary um, agreements um, basically allow to circumvent the mandatory standard that we have here. So that goes um, goes basically um, on, on, on both sides. The second regulatory component, which I have summarized articles 17 to 19, is the harmonization of the request procedure and obligation to safeguard interests. So. Um, there are basically um, requirements that Chapter 5 outlines for requests like specification and demonstration of need proportionality, but also in Article 18 compliance mechanisms, what happens if um, the request is declined or modified, what about disputes. And Article 19 uh, elaborates then on obligations of public sector bodies to safeguard effective interests, as for example, trade secrets or deleting obligations with regard to the data. Now, I think many recommendations could be made in this regard. They are become very technical then to ask whether also the interests are effectively safeguarded. From a conceptual point of view, I have three points to make. The first one is we do have an as information asymmetry. That means upfront, the state does not always know does does uh, a business have uh, data that is helpful to solve the problem what data is there and in these cases i think um the data holders should be required um, best efforts um to identify also available data on the one hand and on the other hand we already heard about the principle of transparency which makes a lot of sense and i think it could be strengthened um, in comparison to the Commission's draft by um, publishing all requests so far, only the requests for public emergencies have to be um, have to be published. And the last um, point is also to introduce more specific procedures on challenging requests, because if it's urgent and um, basically a um, business would decline, then uh, that you should not start then arguing, OK, what is the procedure? There should be a clear procedure in place from the beginning. Now, very, very debated topic is compensation, um, Article 20, and um, 
basically the commission's draft is very clear on that in case of public emergency the data should be provided free of charge i think that makes sense and in case of the broader um empowerment on uh, under article 15 1c for um public interest tasks there should be um also a reasonable margin on top and with that i have considerable problems first of all what does that mean no one really knows and can explain is it fixed cost average cost return on investment is there even a profit margin that could be charged but very generally i think um there's no reasonable economic justification um in this case if and this is what i'm um my, my, i'm making my plea is the, that the scope is strictly limited to ad hoc access because then the reasoning is exceptional and then there is not really um, a justification why you should uh, charge additional um marginal cost of request should be compensated and this brings me to the recommendation i think um the definition should be strengthened we don't have to reinvent the wheel we do have for example a cost standard in the open data directive or in the data governance act so there we can build on um, on components that we already have and in case you put small and micro entities into the scope of um, application I think there should be a I call it protective cost compensation mechanism for these enterprises to avoid that um, basically um, uh, basically an access request quest could overburden them and endanger their existence now the last point very briefly I want to make the question of reuse so the question is once the state has this data what happens with the data right and um, there are um, basically two rules one is um, article 19.1c stipulates a strict derogation of the um, open data um, and public sector information directive I think this is not justified I do understand that there are legitimate interests for the businesses to make sure that they have control and that their data are not reused but only if there is a clash of interests and rights right so I think we can find a smarter way of regulation by nudging them or by I call it a consent solution and by asking the businesses or nudging them to decide whether this data could be reused or not and this goes for the interface um to the data governance act as well the second is privileged access for research uh, I mean this is a discussion that we uh, that by itself we could could have 45 minutes discussion um I'm a bit skeptic whether this really solves the problems of academia without on and research without speaking in my own matters here um but to be realistic I think that um more elaborate rules would um would overburden now the policy debate that we already have so I'm more on the side to abstain from initiative in the frame of this legislative act but there's certainly a need for further regulation in this regard now this brings me to my closing remarks there are some aspects maybe um they will be also discussed I guess on data protection Mario will probably say something is the interface with private rights very important data protection IP and specifically also trade secrets the bottom line the takeaway is um what becomes obviously uh, obvious is the dilemma between effectuating effectuating data for the common good on the one hand while preserving and fostering the incentives to collect and market the data by the business on the other hand and I think um, in general, and this probably doesn't surprise you if you've followed my work and also of Max Planck Institute, that um, I very much favor horizontal approaches and rules, of course, if they are sensibly combined with sectoral regulation. Um, but the scope should be limited and clarified. The first reason is obvious. It was increase, would increase the effectiveness and the legal certainty of the rules. That is very important. But the second, and this is um, actually also my intention, what I want to show in this report is if you do that, you really strengthen the justifications for why preemption that way, why compensation that way, and why to treat um, small, micro, um, and, and medium ent um, enterprises this way. And the third point, maybe a little bit naive to say this in Brussels, but as an academic, I think it can be, um, it, it should be focused, and it's very much exper experimental legislation that you have here. We do not have experiences from other countries or jurisdictions in this domain for this reason it's better to start narrow and then broaden it at a later stage on solid grounds uh, and evidence having said that um I'm um, I'm very happy to discuss the report and there are many more recommendations that are made and I'm looking forward to the discussion thank you very much thank you very much Heiko uh so I will move to our panelists I will start with Matthew uh three minutes per 
for the first round of remarks, and then we will open the floor for Q&A, and we will have also the possibility for a second round of intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. I'm checking the, the microphone is, is working, and this is the, the functional one. Good, thank you. Um, so yeah, great to have an opportunity, as I say, um, to, to present the Vodafone perspective here. Just to very briefly, I think, introduce our state in the discussion. I think that's always helpful to establish. Um, as you will all know, Vodafone is a communications service provider, but in addition to uh, mobile and, and fixed connectivity, uh, we're also making investments and we have a burgeoning port portfolio of what we can call value-added services. Um, and one of the very interesting things that we're investing in is uh, sort of location insights, uh, data analytics services. Uh, a crucial caveat here, these services are aggregated and anonymized. So this is not about um, uh, sort of pinpointing individuals, but it's producing information on movements of people over time within a given cell site. So I think this is perhaps a, a technology that, that, that isn't super widely known, um, but I've seen demonstrations that it's a really compelling uh, product and it has a variety of applications across both private and public sectors. Um, and if I could leave the audience with, I think, one sort of motif running through these remarks, and this is a longstanding, uh, I think, point that we've tried to input into these discussions is, because something is in the common common good or of uh, sort of societal value does not mean it should automatically be uh, for free. Um, and I think maybe I will get the reputation of being a Thatcherite coming out of this discussion, which is not justified in uh, maybe most other settings, but it is an important point to underline. And I think that really has cut a lot to the engagement um, from the industry uh, on uh, business to government data sharing for some time now. Um, Having said that, I think it's also important to, to note the uh, the very positive cooperation, and you, you've made this point already, Heiko, that there is a legacy of engagement and cooperation between private actors, uh, public authorities, uh, sharing and providing access to data in exceptional circumstances, and in particular, in responding to public emergencies. Now, we have a very good practical demonstration of this as a sector in the context of covid uh, the coronavirus, um, where we did group together and we provided access um, for the, the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission, again, to aggregate and anonymise uh, information um, from, uh, from from telecommunications networks, which was important to, to track and monitor the, infecti the effectiveness of, uh, of lockdowns, actually. Um, it, it seems like quite a, quite a throwback to introduce this into the discussion, but it was a very impactful um, initiative. Uh, and, and important to emphasize that, that cooperation was possible within the existing sort of regulatory confines that we have. There were some issues around obviously privacy and the uh, sort of the techn techno technological basis for, for that to take place, that had to be worked through, um, but it was possible. So that's the, that's the starting point. Now, of course, things can be improved upon. And I think that's where we introduced the uh, chapter five provisions uh, of, of the Data Act. Uh, just to quickly share a few reflections um, on the report, which we think is, is a really excellent contribution to the discussion. Um, again, it serves to cut through, I think, some of the, the confusion and the, uh, the inconsistencies that maybe exist in certain provisions of the Commission proposal, particularly, as you say, um, around the, the way that remuneration would be applied in the context of Article 15c um, uh, and the vague and ambiguous definitions and references to in some situations, public emergency, in some uh, sort of exceptional circumstances. So if we could give a very, uh, I think, sort of strong and hearty endorsement to the proposal that you introduce um, to reformulate um, Article 15C to apply only to ad hoc uh, situations of data access, that would be extremely helpful. Um, and again, if there's one underlying takeaway and message that we would like to impart in this session, it is that uh, it, for, for public authorities, run-of-the-mill everyday activities cannot be reasonably construed to sort of to, to actually present exceptional need and that is a logical inconsistency that does exist in the proposal that we think really does need to urgently be addressed uh, at this stage um, so just in in closing for this initial set of recommendations and, and suggestions looking forward now to the, the trial of negotiations which are upon us i think as soon as tomorrow actually the file is moving really, really quickly, um, and I would endorse the, the remarks from the earlier panel, actually, that we really have to pause, you know, and, and we would urge policymakers to do so and consider the implications of what's on the table. Um, and our reflection is that if we do go ahead with um, the, the provisions that we have under Chapter 5 as they stand, we want a, a real risk of squashing 
what is, as I say, a nascent and exciting area of European innovation, which is taking place today in European companies, making it much less possible for firms to actually invest with confidence um, in the solutions that I described. Um, and really, there's there's an underlying, we can say, sort of competitiveness and European sovereignty point that needs to be properly absorbed in the discussions. I'm happy to elaborate on any more of that, but I appreciate it. It's taken up the, the three minutes already, so and I might. Thank you, Matthew. I will give the floor to our two panel, online panelists. I will start with Francois, and then I will move to Marie, and then we will conclude our first round with Anna Rover. Uh, thank you, Francois. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Uh, let me start by presenting the context of my organization. Uh, I belong to the French National Mapping Agency, and uh, our mission is, is to produce geospatial data describing the national territory in order to support public policies. And uh, in, in order to support public policies, we have to supply specific data, that is to say targeted data, uh, that is to say data that are well suited and well fitted to the requirements of certain public policies. And this is the reason why we are interested by the data, uh, by some data from private companies. You know, because to produce uh, targeted data, uh, we need innovative production processes. Uh, let me give you just an example. Uh, you know that there are public policies to fight against artificial soils, to fight against soil sealing. And uh, 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 these public policies, they need uh, large scale uh, uh, land cover data. And in IGN, we, we have developed an innovative process to produce such data by using uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, but we know that private companies, they are innovating a lot and uh, they, they have really very interesting innovative uh, capacities. And uh, uh, just let me give you another example. In IGN, we want to produce forest data and we are currently discussing with a private company uh, that has developed very interesting and very innovative uh, uh, process to produce forest data. So uh, uh, the, the point that I would like to highlight in the Data Act is the, the issue of voluntary data sharing. Uh, I mean that uh, in IGN we want to build a, a partnership with companies uh, and we want to build win-win uh, relation. That is to say that on, on one way, private companies can help us to solve specific problems of specific public policies through, uh, the, through data. And in the other way, we can help private companies to respond to the requirements of public policies. And especially uh, we can help startups and small companies because it's not very easy for them to, uh, to access to a public procurement. So I think that just to, to conclude this short introduction, the point that I would like uh, to be improved in, in the Data Act is maybe if it could introduce rules or legal framework in order to, to foster uh, data sharing, to foster uh, voluntary uh, uh, data sharing agreements between uh, pri private companies and uh, public bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Please, Mario, feel free to jump yes. in. Yes, thank you very much for bringing in the, the, the privacy and data protection, but also the fundamental rights perspective. So it's not much about, about me, about this other perspective, which has not been really uh, discussed until now. Um, so the, the issue here is also an economic, has also an economic value because uh, what we spoke, uh, what has been referred to before is typically the tragedy of the commons where everyone has access to everything for every kind of purpose. So basically imagine a fitness uh, uh, tracker, a Google Fitbit, which can be accessed by government uh, in a quite broad way, and also by companies for every kind of uses, for any kind of purpose, including the commodification, meaning uh, the, the citizens accept to uh, give away is the flow of personal data from, fit, from uh, Google uh, uh, Fitbit in exchange of uh, a financial compensation. You can see the risks uh, in terms for the individual and also for society. 
is not about private rights, it's about uh, uh, public rights, rights, uh, right to privacy, which has a, a, a public and private dimension. So very quickly, in three minutes, to uh, let me step back. Why this perspective is important? Because the Data Act is about non-personal data. This is true. It is about industrial data. For instance, data on crops from machines used in agriculture or for air pollution. But it is also about personal data. It is about connected objects, as I said, about uh, smart watches, fitness trackers, also medical devices. And it is about data generated by us as individuals via these devices. It's often about our most intimate information, sensing and collecting biometric inputs, such as our heart rate, the bloody temperature, menstrual cycle, blood pressure, and sleep patterns. So more than B2B, uh, B2G data sharing, in technically, it's like that, but it is about citizen to business or citizen to government that access and use. For sure, you have read the joint opinion of the DPS and DPB on the Data Act proposal. The opinion is very critical on the proposal. Why? For three main reasons. First, because the proposal was not in line with both GDPR and e-privacy. Second, because the Data Act might normalize and enable, via data portability, the datafication of persons in Europe. What does this mean? For instance, personal data from fitness trackers may be processed for any purpose, as I said, notably commercial purposes. We would welcome instead a definition of the limits of the permissible datification of the human being. As a DPS and the DPB, we strongly recommended the legislator to consider these limits. Libe committee proposed such limits, for example, on data monetization of personal data from internet of bodies, um, unfortunately, we do not have these uh, uh, limits in ITRE and in the council position. Uh, let me hope you can still have these protections for people, especially the vulnerable people. Uh, thirdly, and here we come to the issue of this panel, another source of concern is certainly the access to data, including personal data in the proposal, from public sector bodies. This is very disproportionate. This is not in line with the requirements of quality of law, foreseeability for citizens laid down by the Court of Justice of the European Union. Therefore, Libe position asking the deletion of Chapter 5 of the Data Act is, in light of this, justified. Limiting the scope of such broad, unprecedented access by government to non-personal data, as we have in the EP negotiation mandate, is a valuable compromise solution. In any case, governmental access to data should be in line with the privacy directive. So to sum up and I conclude, looking at both the EP and the council mandates. And in regard to law on the book, it's true that many issues relating to the alignment with GDPR and with the privacy have been addressed. Uh, the EP, the parliament also take into account, took into account the disproportionate access to personal data by public bodies via the horizontal procedure provided by the Data Act. Still, the core issue, and I conclude, the issue linked to the fact that, that personal data are not potatoes, so it's not just about innovation and, and competition, but it's also about an innovation which is also progress. So the, the lack of limits of the datification of the human being, this is an issue which remains on the table and for sure in any way will have to be addressed. I hope Trilogs will bring in this reflection, taking into account the great difference between data from tractors or for uh, ge geospatial data from data from medical device or from a uh, Google Fitbit. I believe the Data Act is an opportunity, still an opportunity for a statute on the permissible use of connected devices in a way that respects human dignity and bodily integrity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mario. Anna, please. Thank you so much and hello to everyone on my behalf as well and happy to be here and um, so thank you Serra for making a nice contribution with these reports into the important topic of, of the data act which we strongly support and we are very happy now that the file has pro progressed and, and we see that uh, it's very important that we have a strong mandate from the council now to pro proceed into the trilogues with the European Parliament. Um, this is such an important file and we absolutely want to support the important goals that it aims to achieve. Um, now, there are so many topics that I would want to cover, but in order to keep this short, um, 
I want to first start up with the rationale. So why do we need these new rules to begin with? And especially now this chapter five and its scope, which is at issue. So first of all, we all know that the value of data comes from use. So no data has value if it's unused. And um, this is what we focus on, the creation of the value with data. And so this is especially the case with chapter five as well. And I really enjoyed this report in terms of framing the conversation around common good so we can all agree that uh, common good is perhaps also a philosophical notion, if you will, but it's a very important notion um, around this topic because we do want to see that data can also serve broader societal needs as well, um, despite the fact that it's de facto also collected and harnessed by private companies. Um, but this can really work um, both ways as well. And we absolutely endorse the, the goal that um, data needs to flow also cross-sectorally and um, also um, benefiting wider societal needs. Um, we do um, acknowledge that um, this is also a very sensitive topic, so we need to be mindful of that as well. Um, and this is why it's also extremely important that there are safeguards and that the rights and the responsibilities are strictly defined. Uh, that said, this is also a good reminder that these will be horizontal rules and principles. So there is inevitably uh, going to be some perhaps one might call it structural leeway, uh, which is quite typical actually in these kind of horizontal broad regulations in EU law. Um, it's also helpful in a sense that we don't want to um, over um, complicate the, the structure. Um, and, and in that sense, it's very important that we also have some leeway for the national authorities, for instance. And that makes me um, segue to my other point, which is the national authorities role going forward. It's crucially important that we have them collaborating um, under this, this um, data act as well. And especially if we look at this chapter five, it will be a, a huge contribution that they will make. Um, I would also urge to look at the work of the forthcoming data innovation board. Um, they might also have a role to play. We hope so. And um, then I would also um, make the point that there are also some further um, enhancements that have already been made in the council in terms of this chapter five. I would only highlight one perhaps key word, which is metadata. It's a very important word. It hasn't been mentioned in this report. It hasn't been mentioned in this seminar, but I do urge everyone to understand its value. Um, it has been added in a number of articles. I could only mention here in terms of this chapter five, articles 14, 17, and 19. Um, it, in terms of um, its role, it's crucial in terms of the findability of the data. So we need metadata um, in order to make data findable, in order to make it more usable. And that also helps in terms of the requests that the authorities are going through uh, in this process, which will also bring benefits to private entities uh, in terms of the streamlined processes. And I hope that that um, can leave us into a balanced um, conclusion um, to, to my initial remarks, but happy to elaborate further. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll have to check whether there are some questions from our physical and virtual forum. Online has been raised a request of clarification about the type of data. In particular for B2B, B2C, the data should be shared is a raw data. For B2G, what kind of data has to be made available? Raw data as well. Francois, Francois has already provided his view online uh, about the fact that, uh, according to him, this not include just uh, raw data. What do you think about it? Please, please, I. You may use this choice. Yeah. Um, Chapter five is is um, different from chapters two and three, so I think you can make analogies because all is centered on the question: um, Does the state solve the problem, the, the acute problem, basically? So um, I would not I would not limit it to raw data. Obviously, the more refined the data is, it can be then um, taken into account in cost compensation rules. And for the same reason, also the question of the technicalities of access are not regulated. Um, in detail, and I think uh, this is good, right? Because um, the question 
really depends on what the request is for and how this purpose is being served surfaced. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's an excellent question. Um, uh, and as you say, the, the answer in the legislation itself is potentially unclear, but maximalist. So, um, you know, you don't have the same scope as you do for chapter two and, and raw, less structured data could certainly be within scope. The question that we would have is, well, well should it be? Um, and certainly we would always rather place the insights on the sharing of insights that are derived from data. And we really do think this is what is potentially useful to public authorities is the provision and application in various different societal circumstances of insights that are derived from data. The raw data itself is potentially not actually that useful to public authorities if they, if they were to acquire bulk um, CDRs and XDRs from, for example, telecommunication service providers, the public authority would you know, have an obligation to ensure privacy, anonymity, et cetera, and that would then need to make significant investments in cleaning, structuring, processing, and analyzing the data in order to, to generate meaningful insights. That is something which companies like, like ours are investing in doing. So our firm um, you know, kind of recommendation would be to, to go to market and, and certainly that sort of market failure test does exist in, in uh, sort of chapter five of the Data Act. We would like to make that more explicit and more robust um, to ensure that that really the onus is on acquiring insights from firms who are making those investments. If really the onus is on companies to hand over raw data sets, as I say, we, we really could undercut what is actually a very um, innovative space for, for European companies. Uh, thank you. Uh do you want to address the same? Well, very briefly, I can yeah. only, only mention that an important point here is that the role of the authority who makes the request will be to really specify what data it needs. So, so this is also crucial. The authority, the public sector body, if you will, cannot ask whatever data uh, there is. Um, it will need to make a specific request, and those requests can then also be subject to modifications or amendments, if you will, uh, later on. And I would here also highlight, again, the role of the metadata in these requests. Um, having said that, inevitably, there's also going to be a certain interplay between, for instance, rules on personal data or, for instance, the e-privacy rules. Um, it's going to be a certain interesting perhaps overlap. I mean, um, we all know that that uh, the e-privacy rules are also subject to um, amendments at, at, as we speak. Uh, it has been a long negotiation process as well, um, and we'll only know further down the road what will lie ahead in, in terms of those rules, but um, certainly also the interplay between, for instance, different uh, new technologies and how they can harness new kinds of data sets um, and machine learning um, and, and, for instance, machine generated data. Those are all very, very interesting interplays that will um, lie ahead. Thank you. Francois, one minute quick reaction. Yes, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we are interested by uh, the data for, from private companies in order to support some uh, public policies. And it is sure that uh, raw data are, are not sufficient to, to respond to the requirements of public policies. This, this was the reason of my, 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 my answer. Thank you. Um, Mary, do you want to add something? on this or another topic i no, just no, want thank, to thank you no thank you very much and thank you for uh, indeed no it's it's interesting also the the interplay with other uh, regulatory initiatives so basically open data directive already there the data governance act also approved already and uh, the regulation of european health data spaces insofar as uh, these may overlap also with the uh, data act uh, provisions on um, uh, um, uh, let's say government access to uh, to data. There could be overlap and all this should be carefully looked at to avoid what, what has been called by some authors a regulatory lasagna. Thank you. Uh, Heiko, you have 80 seconds to share your notes with us. My notes, I took notes, but uh, <laughs> that would be repeating what has been already said. Read the report. I think Sarah has, <laughs> has published a book today. This is already published, right? Where you can read all the three reports. And um, I think I think it takes also some time to digest because uh, the commission's report 
itself is complex. Now there are additional layers of complexity and negotiating mandates. And I'm, I'm very curious about where, where things are heading, um, given also the uh, peculiarities and, and the sensitiveness of, um, uh, of, of chapter five in particular. Okay, so with the digestion phase, we close the circle starting from potato and ending up with lasagna. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and for the lively debate. Thank you. And now, and now we can move to our first and more crowded plan panel that is related to cloud switching. Uh, we will start with the presentation by Daniel Schnur, the uh, that is a SERI Research Fellow and Professor of Machine Learning at the University of Rosenberg. And then we will have a panel made by Sophie Batas, Senior Director of EU Affairs and Head of Brussels Office 3DS. Pierre Chatané, uh, head of unit cloud and software DG Connect, <laughs> Anthony Bagnac, <laughs> EU public policy advisor at Huawei, Francisco Mignorans, secretary general at SISP Cloud, Jeremy Rollins, senior director of the EU government affairs and micro, and Solange Viegas Dors Reis, chief legal officer at OBH Cloud. Please, Daniel. Yes, so the mic is on. Yeah. So it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce to, to the third topic today on the panel, which is on the provisions on uh, switching and in the operability of data processing services in the proposed data. Act. Because we have very short on time and we have a packed panel, I will focus only on the main recommendations of the report and refer you to a more thorough and deal, detailed discussion to the written report. So in summary, the, the main recommendation that we make in the report is that the main focus of the Data Act in these chapters should be on facilitating switching by strengthening data portability. And the rationale behind this overarching recommendation, but also uh, behind then the four individual uh, recommendations that I will come to echoes a lot of what has been said before, especially in the first panel. I think it's very important to recognize that a DA is a symmetric regulation also in this realm. So a horizontal law that will apply to all the players in the markets and set basic rules for this industry. And against this backdrop, I think it's even more important to weigh the benefits of regulation against the potential side effects that could occur and also the, the regulatory burden that have to be borne by all firms in the market. Additionally, I think it's likewise very important to really prioritize simplicity, simplicity, clarity, and enforceability of these rules because it applies to all firms in the markets. And the, the last thing we wanna do is introduce uncertainty into these markets, introduce additional transaction costs. So against this backdrop, our main recommendation is really to uh, facilitate and promote customer switching, one-off switching of data of customers of data processing services. Just to clarify, one-off switching doesn't mean that we think you should only be able to switch once, but to really address what I think has been one of the most or the biggest motivations uh, for this part, uh, the, the potential issue of when the lock-in produced by data-induced switching costs, the, the most important and direct measure to address this is facilitating data portability and therefore switching. Then of course, the Data Act and also proposals now in, in the amendments um, goes further and it uh, makes uh, provisions on interoperability between data processing services, which includes then mandatory standards that would be obligatory for all firms in the market. And while we acknowledge that there are benefits to interoperability, we think that these interoperability obligations should be subject to further justifications and I will come to that. And then also what has been said today already is that of course we now have basic rules in the Data Act, but there are also additional approaches and regulatory instruments 
um, such as sector specific regulation, but then also competition law that can be leveraged to tackle specific issues. Now, the first key recommendation in the report is on the contractual applications. And here the main rationale is to that, that we support uh, several provisions that ensure an effective right to data portability. But then on the other hand, we also emphasize that there should be general freedom to conduct the business. To make that more concrete, so take for example, the maximum transition period, which we think is targeted to the actual switching process and which we therefore support. But we would advocate that the parties that, that come up with a contract, so the customer and the data processing service, should also be able to negotiate a longer term contract. So there should be no general right to terminate any contract there is. And I think this is reflected also now in uh, the proposed amendments of the Council and the Parliament. A very contentious issue has been switching charges. And here we try to strike a balance so that we think on the one hand, we should have some safeguards that there should be no explicit fees for customers that want to switch. So there should be no financial barrier that only accrues to a customer that decides to leave. On the other hand, we think there should be uh, room for some recoupment of regular costs for the provider. What do we mean by regular? So these would be costs that you agree in your contract and that um, occur also maybe during the duration of your regular contract and not just in the act of leaving. This is again informed by the symmetric regulatory regime because it will not only be a few specific providers, but this rule would apply to any provider of a data processing service that may have a big customer leaving and there could be actual costs. Finally, I think it's also important to, for the switching process to acknowledge that there are different parties involved that have responsibilities. And I think also that has been taken up in the proposed amendments. Our second key recommendation on data portability is that we really think to, to have this principle of clarity and simplicity um, that we should have basic rules on the minimum data that should be portable. Should, so that should include the data generated by the user, but also the metadata. And then in addition, we should have uh, clear rules for the format of the data that can be ported in so that we should have the data exportable in a structured, commonly used uh, format and machine readable format. In addition, we make the recommendation that it should not only be a commonly used standard, but that should be a non-proprietary open standard to safeguard it also against, or to make sure that a destination service provider can make use of that data. The third key recommendation is on functional equivalence, which is at the very heart of the Data Act and which has also uh, received a lot of controversy. So here I see two main problems, especially in the original proposal by the commission. And that is that there could be a linkage of responsibilities so that the original service provider could become responsible for the conduct of the destination service provider. And then especially in practice, it will be often be unclear when their subpar performance is it the responsibility of the original service provider or the destination service provider. The other big key issue and problem in practice I see here is that the principle applies to services of the same service type. And while we all have an intuition, okay, what is a different service type, in the detail, it will be very hard to distinguish what is a similar or a same service and what is a different service. And also the definition in the Data Act, I don't think that that helps us very much here. So one thing is that this could be further clarified, which I think has been done in the uh, proposed amendments. In the report, we make a proposal that goes beyond that and that makes a very specific proposal. So namely we propose uh, to replace the functional equivalence criterion by uh, what we call a hypothetical uh, service replication test that instead of targeting the destination service provider targets the original service provider. So the key idea is think hypothetically, you can get your data out of the data processing service by the data portability regime that I just described. Can you take the data back and put it in at the same service provider? Do you end up with the same service in the end? 
the thinking is that this would create a as efficient operator standard, uh, ensuring that the data you get out of the service is of sufficient completeness and quality to actually then recreate that service somewhere else. And it gets rid of this linkage of responsibilities and it also removes the need for classifying services of the same service type. Now, the last uh, key recommendation is on interoperability regulation and I could talk for much longer on that. Our key recommendation here is to tie the mandatory interoperability regulation to additional justification and assessment. And specifically, I propose that it should be either uh, that data portability is found to be ineffective in specific markets or that there are other market failures identified. What are the main reasons for that? Um, just from a technical perspective, it seems very, very complex and challenging to come up with interoperable standards for these diverse set of services that are covered by the term data processing services. And it's also a very dynamic industry. So we do not only need to come up once with a standard, but we need to update that standard. And then finally, we would also have to consider that probably not all stakeholders in the standardization process are interested in coming up with a standard, which complicates things severely over uh, the problems or challenges we encounter already in normal standardization processes. I also want to highlight that these mandatory interoperability standards, they, they have value and they could benefit also market entry, for example, but they could also be adverse effects. So if a standard would be mandatory, then also this could limit or runs the risk of limiting differentiation by new players, because then there's an uncertainty. Do I need to comply with an existing standard or can I come up with something different if I am a similar service than the standard exists. And finally, I think also um, there's still room for market-driven market uh, opportunities for of interoperability. So I would expect that there could also be a market response and an alliance of maybe smaller operators that, um, that try to push this idea of interoperable standards because this has business value to the business user itself. And we are dealing with business users who make strategic adoption decisions here. So without uh, concluding any further, here's a visual representation of the just four components I showed you, which visualizes what our proposal uh, overall would be for these two chapters. And so I'm looking forward to the panel. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, and so we will start a discussion, discussion among our panelists uh, about the relevance of this obligation, about our several recommendations. I will start with Sophie. Please, Sophie, the is yours. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your video with you. It is just uh, the report. There are the report. Um, at as a system, I believe that uh, the ability of uh, cloud service customers to switch from one service to another is uh, an essential requirement for the market. So we uh, therefore support the objective of the data act to unleash the cloud market and to end the networking so as to provide a wider view range of, uh, of services on the European market. We also believe that uh, a balance still needs to be found in terms of uh, the obligations uh, and the scope of this obligation, uh, because in our uh, reading, the proposal currently still raises some legal uh, certainties with regard to the protection of IP and uh, trade secrets, uh, endangering uh, the value um, of the solutions developed by European providers and uh, leading uh, ultimately to a risk of uh, functional regression that would be detrimental for uh, European customers. Ceres report uh, provides a very good understanding of the cloud market and uh, the different layers. And it also highlights uh, very well uh, the different uh, legal uh, uncertainty uh, that it will be bring, brought uh, to uh, data processing services. So uh, on the first recommendation, with regard to the right of uh, customers, to terminate any contract or agreement, we agree that this measure would be detrimental for small service providers 
Um, currently switching may take several months and uh, all the obligations lie still on the originating services. And our position is that contractual freedom and compliance with contract should remain the standard that is as, that is, as it is proven uh, so far. Uh, that it's not only beneficial for the, the, the cloud service provider, but also for the customer. Um, we also support uh, your survey recommendation with regard to functional equivalence. Um, putting the responsibility on the originating service uh, is, is unfair and may lead indeed uh, to excessive litigation. From our perspective, it is also still unclear um, from Article 23 and 29, whether functional equivalence only applies to YAS or if it also applies to SPAS and SAS. And uh, we do believe that functional equivalence uh, on cloud services other than the YAS would be very helpful for Europe's capacity to innovate uh, on the market. Uh, as it would actually basically lead uh, to large-scale harmonization of cloud services, uh, leading in practice to standardization of the service offer on the cloud market. Um, and that would be, um, in the end, detrimental for, uh, for customers in Europe. Um, so we therefore highly recommend an exclusion of PASS and SAS uh, from Article 23 and 29 uh, from functional equivalence obligations. And um, the third point regards the data portability and uh, your second recommendation. We would go a little bit further um, because the issue for us is not only how to make the data portable and interoperable, but uh, what to port. Um, to give you an example uh, from our solution portfolio, um, when a designer creates a chair uh, in 3D using a computer-aided software, um, he enters raw data to medium dimension uh, the fillet on the part, so to round uh, the part uh, of the chair. Um, the entry data will then be processed by the solution through uh, with the support of complex geometric calculations that we'd also call an algorithm uh, in order to provide the best result. And uh, this capacity is actually provided by our solution, uh, the ARCAD solution. The absence of scope of data and metadata in conjunction with functional equivalence requirements at the SAS level puts us in a situation today where we would not only have to port the output data, so basically the 3D model, but also the way this 3D model has been uh, conceived, so um, which is actually our IP. Um, to prevent damage to IP while encouraging that portability, we therefore strongly recommend the introduction of a concept of exportable data which would be output data generated directly by the customer's use of the cloud, excluding any vendor asset uh, covered by actual um, intellectual property rights, trade secrets, or confidential information. To conclude, we are calling on the European Commission, the Parliament, and, and the Council to preserve Europe's capacity to innovate uh, in the software industry and to protect the IP of its company while empowering a, a more competitive market. A uh, major clarification has already been made during, uh, in the past few months during the legislative process uh, by the Parliament and the Council. And uh, we hope that the upcoming trilogue uh, will help the college the state to come up with a balanced uh, regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pierre, do you want to jump in? Uh, just a technical issue. Uh, Keep the, the, the mobile phone away from the microphone because apparently there is some buzzing effect. Uh, okay, thank you. Excuse no, please be able. Which phone? Because I'm on, on flight mode. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone, and, and many thanks to, to Sarah for, uh, for this report. Uh, it's, uh, it's really welcome from, uh, from our side. Uh, Natalie, we're very glad to see that uh, through this report, uh, you're welcoming the, the ambition of the Commission proposal uh, when it comes to uh, overcoming a number of uh, unfair market practices that exist today and that prevent the good functioning of the, of the cloud market in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so we're very glad to see that we're um, uh, all committed uh, to, to this. We really believe that the elements 
uh, that the Commission has proposed in the in the data act, notably uh, for for cloud switching, uh, will really help to boost uh, competition in the in the cloud market in uh, in Europe. Um, so uh, I will try to to come back uh, quickly on the on the main recommendation that you've made in uh, in your report. But before I, I do that, I also wanted to take the opportunity to to thank uh, the the co-legislator, the um, uh, Swedish presidency, notably, which obtained a, a mandate just at the end of uh, of last week to to pursue the, the negotiation um, uh, following the uh, very good work made under the French and Czech uh, presidency. Uh, and in the Parliament, with uh, uh, the INCO committee, who has been uh, following specifically uh, the chapter on uh, on cloud switching. Uh, so the Commission is very glad to see that the um, uh, co-legislator have preserved the key parameters of the uh, of the Commission uh, legislative proposal. Um, we really try to uh, put in place a number of uh, of safeguards uh, around um, uh, the chapter on on cloud switching, uh, but we're of course uh, welcoming. Uh, the, um, uh, the constructive feedback that we're still getting, notably through this sort of, uh, of today's uh, discussion. Um, I wanted to, to quickly comment on a, on a few points. Um, uh, indeed, it's very important to, to preserve contractual uh, freedom, um, but it's equally important to uh, overcome uh, market asymmetries that exist in the in the cloud market. Um, uh, we see that there is really um, uh, huge differences in bargaining power on uh, on this market, um, and uh, therefore it's important uh, that um, uh, the contractual arrangement will benefit both the user and the, uh, and the provider. Um, so from our perspective, uh, it's important that over time, uh, the possibility for users to switch to a different uh, service provider gradually become uh, free of charge. Um, and that this can be made uh, really seamlessly. So really, uh, we really have to look genuinely at all the uh, technical barriers that are still preventing um, uh, the interoperability of data services uh, and the ease uh, for both uh, the provider community, but also at the end for the for the user uh, community to uh, uh, easily move from one service provider to to the other. Uh, we do realize it's a big step for uh, for industry. Uh, it's going to take a few years to to get us there, uh, but we will get there. Uh, so this, this is why the Commission has uh, foreseen a gradual transition. It's not an abrupt uh, transition, uh, but we have uh, been pretty generous uh, for uh, forcing time for companies to adapt their services. Uh, to the various interoperability mechanism that will need to be put in place to allow companies to develop uh, the required open interfaces uh, so that their services can more easily uh, interconnect, interoperate uh, with uh, the one of their competitors. Um, when it comes to uh, those aspect of um, uh, interoperability, um, uh, so uh, it's very important to read uh, Chapter 6 and Article 24 uh, in particular, uh, together with the provision uh, in uh, Chapter 8 under Article 29. So uh, the, the two of them are really uh, interdependent. Uh, um, the Commission will be tasked uh, to identify the relevant uh, harmonized standard, uh, but also open interoperability specification, uh, and we won't hesitate to recognize those whenever they allow to accelerate uh, the, the transition towards uh, interoperability. Um, uh, and this will facilitate interoperability of, uh, of services. Uh, but this will really require everybody to speak the same language. Um, uh, just to take a, an analogy, we're not asking every building uh, to be designed in the same manner. What we're just asking is that uh, in every building there are windows and that there are doors. That's what we're asking for. Really? Windows? Yes. <laughs> uh, that's all we want. Uh, so windows and that uh, people can speak the same language when uh, they are out at the, at the window. Um, the, the next element is uh, on functional equivalence. Um, we do realize that uh, uh, there has been some controversy, but from our perspective, uh, it's mostly in comprehension around uh, this. And the, the very first point I would like to clarify is uh, the scoping of functional equivalence. This is only for infrastructure services. Uh, so functional equivalence is not for platform and software as a, as a service. Uh, uh, we sense that this is something that has been broadly misunderstood 
understood. Uh, and um, indeed, if you have this uh, uh, interpretation, then indeed it will unduly uh, extend the, the scope of uh, the functional equivalence, which is absolutely not the case. Uh, so it's really only for uh, for YAS provider, and uh, essentially YAS is probably the, the uh, most simple example of uh, of portability. Uh, essentially, you do have uh, a number of virtualization technologies, containerization technology, and all we're asking is that uh, the provider ports uh, the the virtual machine, the containers, from one infrastructure to the other without looking what's inside. We're talking about um, uh, infrastructure uh, services. Um, there are uh, a number of tools that are available on the on the market as well to to do this effectively uh, already. That's what uh, most companies are using today uh, when uh, they are uh, confronted with this sort of uh, of transition. So we're we're fully confident that this reflects market reality uh, already. Um, Maybe the, the last point on um, uh, mandatory uh, interoperability, uh, just to um, uh, go a bit further in uh, what is uh, addressed in uh, Article 29. So uh, the, the Commission will be empowered to look broadly uh, at what exists, uh, um, harmonized standard, uh, open interoperability specification proposed by industry. Uh, and the Commission, uh, of course, in consultation with relevant stakeholders, with the member state, uh, will have the possibility to recognize those uh, in a Commission uh, repository. Uh, from the moment uh, these are taken up in a Commission repository, uh, it will be expected that all market providers start developing uh, interfaces that are uh, compliant uh, with uh, those interoperability uh, mechanisms. So in this way, this allows uh, to have um, a visible um, uh, and clearly um, comprehensible for any market actor, uh, SMEs and uh, uh, large providers uh, alike, to know what they have uh, to put in place uh, at the interface of uh, their services. Again, we're not looking at what is happening within the software. What we're asking is for uh, companies to develop interfaces uh, at, um, uh, at the surface of, uh, of their product. Um, I think I will leave it at this for now and uh, looking forward to uh, further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And so, what about these windows? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I understand I have three minutes, right? Is that correct? Okay. Um, so maybe I give a bit of, of, of context about what we do as well. Um, so Huawei has launched his, his cloud services in Europe for six months, basically in November last year. So that actually be five months. But we are a global player in the cloud market, um, not only in Europe now, but in other countries. And it's interesting to see this because a, a few years ago, we didn't have any cloud services. And the reason why we managed now to be in top five of the infrastructure as a service is because of what Daniel mentioned before. Um, that is to say that it's market driven because we have had a strategy of having open interfaces. We have had a strategy of being uh, open, having open hardware, open software, and then building of our partners. That's how we've been able to work with universities, with startups that have these needs of flexibility for the R&D, basically. And I think it tells a lot about the reason why we have also launched our services, because, uh, I mean, you must all know that uh, last year, 2022, it's after the release of the Data Act, it's after the release of the Data Strategy. And it seems that before that, it was very difficult for a, a player in Europe that wants to have this open strategy of interoperability to exist in Europe. So I think we are a good example of what can happen in Europe if you have this market driven, if you have a market that desires interoperability. And so it tells a lot about the fact that we have this desire of comply, first of all, with such interoperability uh, requirements. We have the desire to help also the rest of the market by contributing to the specification, contributing to this repository, contributing to all the players sitting together in order to have all of this. And of course, uh, we, we have a desire to support these policies, uh, however we can do this. So we've been doing this uh, in the past. We are doing it now in Europe as well for specific European needs. Uh, and I'm happy to, to go more in detail about the specific projects now that we have uh, in order to make this happen. Now, coming back exactly to uh, the recommendation uh, uh, from Daniel's report, uh, I think two things. The very positive one is clarity. Uh, as as uh, Daniel mentioned before, and he would say about a lot of confusion and comprehension, I think the report gives a lot of clarity. For instance, the, the, the part concerning portability and interoperability, 
so many discussions we've had in the industry, but also with policymakers create all that confusion. Is this interoperability? Is this portability? What are we trying to do? And I think the report it really clarifies this and, 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 and the need for open interfaces in some cases. Where maybe we would disagree and, and, and happy to discuss this further is the fact that some market inefficiencies have not been proven yet. I think they have done it. I think it has been proven that there are market inefficiencies in Europe uh, for certain markets. Um, the ACM, uh, as it's mentioned in the report as well, has underlined a lot of them. Uh, I remember also a report from a, a Spanish startup association that basically says every single issue and how certain cloud providers, small companies, small developers are completely locked out of the market and they cannot integrate it because they have this lack of interoperability and portability. So that, that's where we would probably disagree, but the rest is frankly uh, quite amazing. Uh, the idea of proposing something different for functional equivalence while everyone in the industry has been struggling to really understand, and that's the case also for our own engineers, trying to understand how are we gonna manage this functional equivalent concept? Our lawyers are thinking the same. Will we be able to do this? How can we collaborate with the new players? All those questions, it's an interesting alternative that we have here but happy to discuss all the other uh, alternatives that are there as long as we have this legal certainty that all the cloud players, the big cloud players, the small cloud players, the innovators all need. So yeah, that's, um, that's our position. Thank you very much. Uh, Francisco, it's your turn. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see uh, some familiar faces. Um, I was asked to comment on the, uh, so I'm here at CISPE, Cloud Service, um, infrastructure service provider in Europe. Uh, I'm not here as Gaia X, but I'm a member of this organization, which you might be familiar, actually a funding member. It's an interesting organization because it tries to find the uh, sweet spots between cloud service provider and uh, the uh, owner or the controller uh, processor of the data, uh, of the data spaces, and try to find uh, a place where both meet. So, um, but no, I'm, I'm here at CISPE, and uh, at CISPE, we, uh, we have mostly uh, only a uh, cloud service provider. And when we saw the Data Act and specifically this report, uh, I'd just like to comment on three points. Um, the, the contractual uh, requirement, um, termination, and uh, lack of cost for switching. And then the uh, functional equivalence, and, and everything I'm saying is public, so uh, at least it's been it's been uh, um, you know reported in uh, in the position taken. So on, on the contract, working with um, with uh, cloud providers who rely on such contract, most of them are smaller European guys. They are you know companies of uh, up to ten billion euros maximum. Um, that's the vast majority of the members in our group, but usually also maybe 10, 10 million to you know up to 10 billion. That's that's not that big compared to some of the guys. Um, so what they were a little bit worried, for example, on the contract is if you get a you know let's say a 50% reduction because you take a longer contract as opposed to a you know a pay-as-you-go service that you can take for one minute and pay just for that. So if you take uh, a, a longer term commitment. And then there is a new provision that uh, changes the, the contract law and allows you to uh, you know, terminate this, uh, this uh, longer co um, commitment. What will happen is uh, simply that this kind of uh, you know, better, better deal will not be available because you know, if, you, if you give a discount and people walk out of your contract because they invoke uh, whatever you know, special provision, contract provision, is that going to remain as an alternative? No. So I think the, the 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 effect, the perverse effect of this thing is it will make it more expensive for the for the client. So that's one thing I wanted to flag. Um, free of cost, yeah, that would be nice. But sometimes you have to transfer the data, you have to do a certain amount of operation, and so if the contract is transparent, as the as the um, the, the requirement of the data act demand. Then you should know as a user, customer, B2, B2B or B2C, that you are entering in, a, in an agreement with a provider. And if, if the day you want to go out, you should know precisely, clearly, well in advance before you enter in the contract, if there are any costs and what those costs are. So I think if that requirement is, uh, is met, um, it's already a big, uh, a big uh, improvement. 
And last but not least, functional equivalence. Um, on uh, the principle of it, it's uh, it's an easy. I think it's easy. You know, when we we've done it uh, uh, for YAS services for infrastructure, uh, the formulation and that's that's public knowledge. Okay? Yeah, the formulation for us was uh, unclear uh, for the for the providers, and we saw several. You know, we had several concerns, including one that is in the recommendation two or three here, which is that. Um, Maintaining similar, let's say, uh, resilience, security level, availability. This is very nice in, in theory, but in practice, if you move from a provider who has 10 data centers in 10 different countries with the highest possible level of redundancy and security to a smaller provider who has two data centers in two countries, you simply cannot maintain uh, you know, the same level of, uh, you know, availability, resilience, it's really complicated, the SLA are going to be different. So, so there were some, some concern. That being said, uh, the, uh, the organization and the provider, we all support this, uh, this, uh, I mean, the customers are asking for portability interview. So, so you have to deliver on that. So, and our concern is that the law is really nice. It's really, you know, nice uh, theories, nice requirements. But it's, you know, in the end, you need to apply this in a very technical and pragmatic manner. And uh, what the customers have told us and what the, the members of CISPA have said is, guys, if you wait to, you know, work seriously on this portability for the data act to enter into force, and then for, you know, the commission, the and his colleague to request certain, you know, technical specification, et cetera, to be developed by European standardization body, in three years, we're still waiting for you know the portable services. So, so what we did last year, last week, and, and Pierre, you were there. We announced a commitment as a, a European cloud uh, infrastructure service provider to already fast track, fast forward the uh, development of the technical specification um, to make the data act a reality, not just a nice uh, and the portability uh, of, of services switching a reality. Um, we, the companies cannot afford to wait and neither can the customers. And since, since this is also, you know, tying in what Europe is trying to do and deliver in the GAIA-X environment, so, so we need to do it. And, I, and we've had a discussion last week about, okay, having a nice, super, you know, legally, you know, nicely constructed uh, regulation in the digital world for to, to regulate digital item, it's extremely challenging. And you can end up in situation where a regulation is only applied through sanctions and fines. I mean, what is happening with the uh, GDPR? It's, it's really nice, but, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, it's really difficult. And many, many companies may not be playing by the rules. Uh, so fines, uh, you know, concerns, maybe lack of trust, so it's similarly for the Data Act, uh, I think the uh, industry and customers, they need to be pragmatic. And uh, there is now a legislation that says you should provide portability, interoperability. So how do you do it? And this is what we are, we are now uh, the next challenge, but it's not gonna be a legal one, it's gonna be a technical one. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what about Microsoft's point of view? Well, Maybe I'll pick up where Francisco left off. I, I think I've heard a lot that we would agree with on the panel. I think the what is rather easy to agree on. I think the how is where we run into some of the technical feasibility challenges. Um, if we're talking just about switching, I think you know making it easier for customers to move and, and actually multi-home, in fact, is where we see most of our customers uh, existing. You know, all of that is understandable. We see it on the market. Um, we make commitments in that space. I think. It was an important distinction that the report called out, and Enzo mentioned this earlier too, you know, the difference between interoperability and portability in that context. And again, I think that gets back to what Francisco was mentioning at the very, very end, which is, you know, the how matters, you know, how we get there is where I think we start to have some nuance and perhaps disagreements about the feasibility of some of the obligations. Um, sticking to the report, I there's several recommendations that I think are going in the right direction. I think we'd always want to nuance those a bit further. Um, I kind of like uh, recommendation 3B simply because it's premised on the functional equivalence criterion remaining, and I have a suspicion that it'll likely remain. So I think I like it more than 3A. 
only out of reality, but it reflects a really important principle that it's just, you know, you can't be responsible for environments you don't control. So there is, I think, an elegant fix there to the original proposal when you talk about ensuring versus facilitating. We can do everything in our power and under our control to facilitate a functionally equivalent experience or what have you. Um, but to be held responsible for it, particularly in the time commitments and with the different types of data that would be implicated, I think that's where you run into uh, the lack of a one-size-fits-all approach that would work. I think when it comes to the interoperability bits, I, I do think you know problem definitions are important there. I think the report calls that out. I think it's it's helpful to hear you know from the commission as well, as you said, you know what layer of that is actually looking to be standardized. And how you get there and you know how involved industry is in that process is going to be important. But you know, we've made a lot of commitments in this space. And I, I hope, like Francisco mentioned as well, you know, other companies will continue to you know get ahead of some of this where we see that market demand. Um, I think it really comes down to how this will roll out practically and how we'll actually get there. What will some of these terms mean? I think there's still a lot of ambiguity in the text, to be honest. We're hoping that negotiators uh, have an opportunity to still clarify that. And then maybe finish, finishing up where others started, you know, the contract point is one I think we also would agree on, and you have to read it in combination with many other articles. You know, there is this prohibition on obstacles to switching, which is straightforward enough. There's the termination periods and the periods for portability delivery, which are rather restrictive. And when you also have a prohibition on switching charges, when you take that all together, it does amount to, I think, a bit the scenario that Francisco described, where you're, you're really implicating the way a lot of those long-term reductions and long-term deals are you know commonplace in the market and i think that could have negative impacts on cloud users in europe rather than the goal of the regulation itself so i think i agree with a lot that's been said here and i think we all agree on the what and i think it's where the how comes in that we still are hoping to get a little bit more detail Thank you, Jeremy. And to conclude so, our first uh, round of intervention, we have the, the floor is for uh, Solange, who yes. is joining us online. Solange, do you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Please. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, it's okay. Better. Uh, first, thank you to the to the sir for having uh, invited me and uh, for this event, this uh, this important event. And sorry, I regret I regret that I will I could not uh, join you uh, in person today. Um, from the perspective of OVH Cloud, uh, that is a leading uh, European cloud provider, uh, the DAT Act is a very major legislation uh, for the European data economy, of course. Uh, in line uh, what all the other speakers have said, um, we, we believe that we have now today a good opportunity to set up clear rules. Those rules uh, are a big part of a level playing field, an European level playing field we, uh, we, we, we defend at uh, OVH Cloud. Uh, and the Data Act has a very critical role to play on it. Regarding the, the, what has already been said and the limited, limited, limited time um, to speak, I will focus mainly on the recommendation number one of this year to, uh, to talk about the, the contract uh, um, There is a lot to say, but I, I, I would like to, to focus on um, two, two topics. First one, if, of course, the switching costs. Um, the, the draft of Data Act currently is uh, is uh, is clear on the fact that switching uh, what we call egress fees must disappear. For it is very important that to distinguish what are um, what are egress fees and incompressible switching charges. That means that. Incompressible switching charges can be applied from, from our des, other understanding. Those charges must be, of course, uh, I think that uh, it's what uh, was already been told by the CSP, must be predictable, transparent, cost-based, uh, and known at the date of the signature of the agreement between the, the cloud provider and its customer. 
so the, the transparency and the cost orientation of the the, the treating charges it's it's okay what we want to 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 um, what we we want to avoid is what we call egress fees what is very applied today and what we see uh, uh, in part in the market um, and those egress fees should be abolished right now we should Contrary with what the draft of the Data Act uh, has, is, is providing currently, we are, we, it is saying that um, egress fees should be abolished in three years. We believe it should be done now. Why should we expect three years for this abolition? Every, everyone, everybody agree on the fact that such egress fees are no, no longer acceptable. So there is no reason to wait until 2027 for that. So it's one of the points that is very important for us. It's immediate ab abolition of those fees. And we, we, we hope that the trilogue will, will uh, allow us to, to, uh, to move forward uh, in, this, in this way. Um, uh, and why we cannot wa wait? It's too because the European market is moving very fast. Uh, we, there is a risk of market consolidations. Currently, the market shares of many players are, are increasing a lot, and we see we, we see that the, the 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 market share of the European players is reducing year after year very fast too. So we need to have it immediately applied this uh, this abolition. Um, in addition, what I would like to uh, um, one point that is very uh, very important is the possibility to exempt some cloud services from uh, from, um, from, uh, from the, the, the abolition of egress fees. We believe that no, no exemption should exist on the switching rules. All cloud services, even for trial purposes, uh, even for free, uh, free, free services, must apply those switching rules, especially in regarding the egress fees. So for us, it's uh, at another key point on which we think, that we think that the Data Act should be improved during the trilogue. And uh, just to, to finish on the, the, the last point I would like to highlight, um, the, the Europe, the, I think that it's the European, uh, the Council, yes, the Council uh, has introduced a new article 24A about the transparency of the localization of the data. Of course, for us, it's key to have to allow the, 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 the user to know precisely where is data is stored, from where the data is accessible, and what is the regulation applicable to this data. Why? Because from our understanding, the Data Act aims to improve the freedom of choice of the customer. Freedom of choice includes to have a clear knowledge of the cost, of the, of the risks of the data, of the regulations applied to this data. So it's, uh, it's something that we, 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 we agree with the Council on this, uh, this, uh, this new article and we, we hope it will remain in the final draft. Thank you, Solange. Uh, just to check whether there are questions from the floor. I have no question online, but just to check whether no, no question for our speakers. Otherwise, I would ask Daniel to start our second round of quick reaction. You may address some of not the compliments, we just take the compliments and we are happy about that. Uh, but there are also other stuff that has been raised in the first round that probably you, you want to address. Yeah, maybe um, just quickly and also what Pierre raised. Um, I mean, we I had this point on balancing uh, protection of customers, but also the freedom to conduct business. I mean, a very constructive idea that comes to my mind is instead of 
saying there must be a right to terminate any contract, it could also be directed at making or ensuring that the customer has the availability of options in the beginning. So there must be the option that you can always have a, a contract that you can cancel at every time. I mean, that's a characteristic of most cloud services anyhow, that it's elastic and on time. And then you can go beyond that with longer term contracts, which I think is also in line. I mean, even in, in these markets, we, we mostly have business customers and there might be asymmetries that's fully acknowledged. But even in consumer markets, we still allow for longer term contracts usually. So I, I think um, the options should still be there. Also to consider, I think, also for smaller players, these longer term contracts can be an instrument to really have uh, customers bound to their service. So this creates a certainty also uh, for investments. And I think uh, that could be important. Yes, maybe I stop here. I may have some points in the final round. Okay. Um, so I will follow the initial order. One minute with quick reaction per panelist. I will start with Sophie. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think, uh, thank you very much for the panelists. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Pierre, for the reinsurance uh, with regard to applicability of functional equivalence. Uh, I mean, we insist that maybe some uh, part of those Article 23 and 29 should be uh, revised, but we are quite uh, happy with uh, the evolutions at the at the council, the efforts of the council and the parliaments to uh, to clarify. So I think it's all on on you now during the trilogues to uh, to find uh, the the final compromise. Um, nothing else from my side. Thank you. Thank you. And so please. Uh, yeah. obligation and the conversation around functional equivalence they all come back to and, and even the one on standards that uh, francesco you, you mentioned before they all come back to the collaboration between the different parties and i think that's also something that we have discussed a lot internally and i mean for 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 the information when we discussed this we didn't have even one customer in europe so it's really on, on every side, uh, from the original provider, the, the, the destination provider, the user side, we don't have a mechanism within the cloud switching provisions that promote collaboration between the destination provider, the original provider, and the user. And I can very understand the reason why the burden is on the original provider, because this needs to be solved and we need to sort of break those barriers that we have. But in order to have this switching, in order to have this interoperability, you need the collaboration of all the parties involved. If you put the burden with a certain amount of days on, on the original providers, these original providers needs to know that the destination provider give the information in the right time, that the user is here to cooperate as well. Otherwise, we enter into a world where we don't know how we can be how we will be able to collaborate with one another we don't know if it will be easy to switch from that provider to another provider because then we don't get the information at the right time all these collaboration processes they need to be inside as well and we have seen this in different uh, uh, legislation that are not related to cloud and I, I, I don't need to mention any of them here because they might not be relevant at the technical level but this collaboration is necessary and this will impact the functional equivalence requirements, this will impact the contractual obligation, this will impact the standards making, all of this will have a positive impact throughout the text. Yeah, no, sorry, that was the only the only comment here, otherwise we can discuss about everything. You're young and full of passion. Yeah, yeah. right. No, I'm, yeah. I'm, my passion is fading. <laughs> Not the patience, the passion. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I'd say two things. First, uh, in, in our organization now, although the legislation is not yet finally adopted, we have moved, we are moving towards implementation and making this thing work because we can be in many fora discussions, but at the end of the day, we need solution for the market. This needs to be reflected in the Gaia X federated services, et cetera, yali yali, and the customers are asking for that. So, and now that there is a legislation, we have no option. It has to be done. So let's do it. Um, my second comment is um, is a bit of a frustration that I want to share because um, in at the beginning of the Data Act, 
Well, first, cloud infrastructure. Cloud infrastructures, you know, without, without uh, let's say, an operating system and the software that runs on it or the virtual machines is absolutely useless. It's like having, you know, electricity, but not electrical, uh, you know, equipment or machines uh, or the other way around, having a computer without electricity. But anyway, so, and we, we had hoped at the beginning that, uh, you know, software portability, software license portability, moving, you know, workload from one provider to the other would also be facilitated. But that unfortunately was not, uh, was not uh, included, neither in the original proposal uh, from the commission nor in the current, in the current um, uh, compromise. And that is the only, let's say, regret that we have, but you know, we, will, we will keep working on you know, concrete and positive stuff and we'll, uh, we'll get over it. Thank you. Well, listen, I think there's a lot of agreement on the panel. I don't, I was expecting to see more disagreement, to be honest. Um, and again, I think there is different interpretations of some of these terms and some of that will become clear in the course of the negotiations and some of that will become clear in the course of implementation. Um, but, you know, where we stand, I think you can see where the main concerns are that we want this to be aligned to what the outcomes were identified at the beginning, a diverse cloud market, of course, easier customer multi-homing and switching, a uh, dynamic set of services available to European users. And, you know, if we land on the right interpretations, I think we can still get there. Um, we also are looking already to implementation of this. I think we have a general sense of the direction. And there's just some key terms that I think coming back to the contract points and new concepts like functional equivalence that we still want to make sure our engineering teams understand sufficiently. Yeah, many thanks. A um, uh, few reactions from my, from my side. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I mentioned the, the, the importance of um, uh, symmetry in contract negotiation. Uh, I think eventually we're, we're going to get there. The, the point on fixed term contract is uh, is well taken. Uh, many thanks for this. Uh, I think this is something we have to maintain the possibility to have a fixed term contract, and this is also part of the uh, of the symmetry in contractual arrangement. Uh, if you commit yourself for a five years or 10 years contract, the, the provider must make huge investments to uh, um, uh, deliver on, uh, on that contract. So you can't leave uh, after three months uh, without uh, uh, expecting something to, to happen. So uh, the symmetry is a, a two-way street. Um, uh, it's a tautology, but uh, yeah, you, you see what I mean. So it's a commitment on, on both sides. Um, uh, I think Jeremy, you, you referred to this, uh, and I think this is uh, also uh, very much in the spirit of what we're aiming at, but we need to have balance in that triangle between uh, the source provider, the destination provider, and the, and the user. Uh, sorry, it's a bit of a menage à trois, but uh, uh, in the end, that's where we need to have a good equilibrium and have all parties uh, playing fair game in the best interest of, uh, of all parties. Uh, we, we do understand that this represents a major change of practice uh, that we're um, uh, imposing through through the data act uh, but it's really a win-win that we're trying to to create uh, uh, if this works out uh, i mean we do expect that the entire industry is going to move to to the cloud that's also what we're promoting uh, as a, a commission policy uh, we believe cloud is good for the industry uh, it will help their competitiveness it will it supports digital transformation of uh, organizations uh, if companies, uh, public sector want to do artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, big data analytics, they must use cloud. Uh, uh, it's uh, really the only way and they should focus on the use of those tools rather than uh, on uh, the, the core services that people uh, or other uh, companies are better equipped uh, to uh, to provide them with. Uh, but decision makers will only make that step. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but we are really running out You're of really time. You're really running out of time. Uh, Companies will only make that decision step to move to the cloud if there is uh, really freedom to move uh, to whatever provider they want. Sorry, I was wrong. Solange. Yes, uh, just to finish what we are talking about, uh, switching uh, switching between cloud providers is is not only to contribute to the level playing field and to to, to contribute to the competition, is, is, is always to the benefit of the user because uh, the switching, an easy switching, it's a way to, to facilitate, facilitate multi-cloud. 
and we believe that multi cloud is key for the users of the uh, of the of the cloud products so ju just to finish we we at OVH cloud we are confident that the trilogue discussions will allow to keep uh, concrete improvements we obtain in the data act and uh, we we want to keep in mind the, the overall goal to ensure user users freedom of choice when users use the cloud thank you Solange. daniel you deserve the final words yeah so thank you everyone uh, for this i think great panel maybe some some final thoughts also on the the way forward and um drawing on what i think enzo said and also jeremy we we're moving towards the how and how to implement it and i think that will be crucial and there i also want to echo a little bit what was has said, been said i think on the second panel that also now in the negotiations i think it's important to also take the time now to to consider where this could go in practice and how could we implement it and maybe not only take the the first use case that comes to our mind but also to think of other possible applications of these rules because what i highlighted in the report i think is really that it's a horizontal law and so it will affect a lot of uh, different use cases and we have such diverse markets so we're talking about yes on the one hand but of then also software as a service on the other hand and they are especially with respect to the interoperability part i think it's important to consider the different uh, the options and the implications that has uh, is coming from there and especially because it was highlighted by Pierre also that it's also about competition then sometimes I think in upper interoperability the thinking is okay interoperability will help the smaller players but that's not necessarily the case and so I think we should uh, weigh the benefits that we see there but also the adverse effects that could happen and then of course the way how we implement it technically and in these very dynamic markets which will be a big challenge okay thank you everyone those attending our conference interesting and insightful com conference on my side one takeaway just one take if you have done yet please go reading Sarah data act book that has been released online today and more even most importantly we have a reception and in the club area, we will discover, it. they told me it's down the hill, but I guess we, we will find out where it is. Again, thank you everyone for joining us in this insightful and lively discussion. Thank you.